They've continued to work and grow and implement their program and are setting the foundation for what they want to get accomplished here over the next couple of seasons. I think one of the most intriguing teams this offseason is the Miami Dolphins. The Dolphins have the capital to do whatever they want. They're competing and building a culture. I believe in team. I would say that. If you want to strive to do something great um, as a group, you got to work together. You have a plan, you stay true to the plan, you execute the plan. The Dolphins, this is how you turn around a franchise, like this. We're trying to build a team that's going to win right now, and uh, we'll be very aggressive. Welcome to the field, your Miami Dolphins. We're looking for guys who are tough, who are smart, who are competitive, love to play. They have landed some big fish. Love what the Miami Dolphins did. You're trying to build something there. Let's have some fun and play together, man. Win on three, win on me, one, two, three, win. If you can get a group of young men to band together, to believe in one another, to practice and prepare at a high level, then you'll win ball games. Welcome, everyone, back for another special episode of Inside the NFL. It's your boy, Reason, and I'm back riding solo dolo tonight. EM Dolphin fan is out on business, so it's just going to be me sitting back in the pocket all alone like Dan Marino before he had his first 1,000-yard rush and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, guys. But I will be joined tonight by a very special guest. Um, I know I, along with some of our subscribers, have talked about him on this channel before we Absolutely love his coverage. You know, I put him right up there with, a, you know, personally, I don't think there's anyone better than the guests we're going to have tonight, Barry Jackson and Cameron Wolf. I think those are the three guys that everyone should be following when it comes to getting your Dolphins coverage. Um, he's an absolutely fantastic beat writer. Um, he's been covering the Dolphins for quite some time now for um, all Dolphins on Sports Illustrated. And he also does um, Dolphins, all Dolphins Digest, which is actually a fantastic read as well. So, guys, without further ado, if you could just please welcome Mr. Alan Pupar to the show. Alan, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on, sir. I appreciate you taking the time out of your night. No, oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. So um, you, like me, are Canadian, um, Canadian roots. So let's. I just wanted to ask, um, before we really dive into the Dolphins, how did you become a Dolphins fan? Well, it, I, ironically enough, I, I grew up in Montreal, and we used to come down here to Miami on vacation every winter. And so the kind of the first team that I ever saw play in the NFL was the Miami Dolphins giving away my age here a little bit, but the first NFL game I ever saw on television was the 1971 Christmas classic between the Dolphins and the Kansas city chiefs. Uh, and then coming down here every winter, that's the team that I, I started following and uh, eventually started covering the team. And, and now again, um, covering the team is kind of, a, is a different thing than being like a fan per se. And I don't know that if you talk to, to all the beat writers, um, we're fans of trying getting to do exciting work and the exciting work is when the team does well and gets to the playoffs. So, um, sure. in, in that sense, we're bandwagon writers. <laughs> so, well, okay. Further expanding on that. When was the moment that you knew I want to eventually write for this team? I want to cover this team. Well, there was never a time where it was to be, to be very honest, where it was, I want to cover the dolphins. I wanted to be a sports writer since I was, shoot nine ten years old uh so that that goes back a long way and fortunately it came to fruition mm -hmm. so i mean you said yourself the first game you really went to or saw sorry was the the christmas um matchup in 1971 between the kansas city chiefs and the miami dolphins so 
you've been through the good years, i.e. the perfect season, um, the back-to-back -back championships. Um, you've been through the rough times, the post Marino era. I mean, we could pretty much culminate most of that other than, you know, when Ricky was there and we had those really stellar defenses for the most part. Mm -hmm. Offensively, especially at the quarterback position, we've kind of been a little inept. Um, have you can have you seen this kind of excitement from the fan base or anything close to the kind of excitement you're seeing right now with Tua Tagovailoa since Marino left? Like, does Ricky Williams the trade of acquiring Ricky Williams does that even does that pale in comparison? Basically, it, it, yeah, it does pale in comparison. There's nothing like this. It's it's crazy. And one factor that's in play now that wasn't wasn't in play at the time of Ricky is social media is so much bigger now than it was back then. Um, and Ricky was it was a great player and it was a big acquisition and fans were excited about getting him. But the way fans are about two, it's like crazy. Uh, the only thing I can even equate it to at any point of anybody's career, I would say, is that maybe Marino after his first year when fans saw what he could do. And then at that point, it was like, oh, my God, this guy's this guy's unreal. He's going to be awesome. Uh, we got a great quarterback. So you, there was that sense of excitement. But as far as a player coming in, nothing even remotely close to what it is with Tua right now. I mean, it's it's over the top, really. <laughs> and what are your thoughts specifically? Actually, let's start this. What were your thoughts on Tua pre-draft? Like, where were you at? Because I know a lot of people were either on the fence or people on one side say, hey, roll the dice. Other people saying it's too risky at five. Where where did you fall into that? Well, here's the thing. I am not in the camp, and, and I, I I think I'm one of the few beat writers who cover the, the team who doesn't necessarily think two was a slam dunk Hall of Famer if he stays healthy. Um, I do think he has that possibility, and I think everything he showed at Alabama – would lead you to believe he's going to be very good. But there's also the fact that, and you can't get away from the fact that he played with easily the best wide receiver core in, in college football, if not certainly last year. And then maybe over the past 20 years, I mean, they had two first round picks last year with Jerry Judy and Henry Ruggs, the third, they could have two more next year with Devonte Smith and uh, Jalen Waddle. The offensive line's tremendous. So he had everything set up. To really to succeed. Uh, now, having said that, you can't take away from the fact the guy's really, really accurate. Mm -hmm. The one thing is, if you looked at Joe Burrow at LSU, how many plays did he make when the, the pocket would collapse? He would go outside, of, uh, avoid three rushers, and then throw a 30-yard strike down the field on the move. Uh, you didn't necessarily see that many of those types of plays from Tua. So having said all that, um, I like Tua. I don't think he's a slam dunk that everybody thinks he is. There's the injury factor as well. Mm -hmm. But the Dolphins having waited so long for a franchise quarterback at number five, I, I don't think really had a choice but to, but to go for it. Mm -hmm. So how much – okay, in terms of – because I know Joe Burrow on a lot of people's radars before last year was like a fifth, sixth round yeah. pick. Um you know, how much stock do you put into the fact that Joe Burrow had what a lot of these, and I'm not a Herbert fan, I'm a love and a Tua fan coming out of that draft. So how much stock do you put in the fact that Burrow, he was, you know, he had online correspondence courses for the most part. So from what I understand and what's come out is from Monday to Friday, he was able to spend his days basically in the film room, um, you know, with his coaching staff on top of that you know, Joe Brady came over from the New Orleans Saints and, you know, Joe Brady, a former receiver himself, you know, that offense was really built to manufacture space for guys like Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, et cetera, et cetera. Not taken away from Joe Burrow, but that's just schematically the basis of it. So how much stock do you put into the fact that Joe, and this is not just against Tua, but Joe Burrow, the way he was able to rise, able to send draft boards over people like Justin Herbert, who a lot of people say if he would have came out the year before, he would have been in that top five or possibly been the first pick. Um, I still don't think he's better than – the, the, uh, but anyways, I don't think he's better than Kyler Murray, but okay. Um, you know, Jordan Love, et cetera, et cetera. How much stock do you put in the fact that Joe Burrow was basically able to film study in the day, Monday to Friday, while all these guys were basically taking classes? I mean, 
you know, do you think that could have been a factor of why you saw such a leap in his game? Well, yeah, I'm sure that played a part in it. But the bottom line is they still made the plays. Uh, and, and again, a lot of what he did was more physical and athletic than what Tua did. Mm-hmm. A lot of what a lot of Tua did was three steps, quick the balls out, and very accurate on a quick slant. And then the, the wide receiver breaks a tackle and goes 50 yards, or it's a swing pass, and guy takes it 50 yards as well. Whereas Burrow made a lot of plays off script. And I think I would venture to guess, I haven't broken down the numbers, I would venture to guess that Burrow made more big off script plays than Tua did. So mm-hmm. I'm so while there's no question that it did help Burrow, I don't think that's that's the reason he was so more successful last year at LSU when he had what arguably was the best season that any college quarterbacks ever had, especially when you consider the competition. Mm-hmm. And what did you think about his receiving core? Because I know you talked about how good about um, yeah. and I mean his offensive line, you know, Cushion Barry and Damian Williams, they went pretty high in this in this draft too, and even um, you know. <laughs> Jamar Chase could possibly be the first wide receiver off the board next year. Um, Clyde Edwards Hilaire was the first running back gone, too. I mean, you look at both of these guys, they had crazy, you know, they, I agree with you, they had crazy weapons. Um, and and the, as far as the offensive lines, I really do believe LSU's interior is better than Alabama's, but I believe the Alabama tackle situation was, was definitely better for sure. Um, you know, what were your thoughts? Um, in terms of, I, I just I know they're not dolphins, but I just wanted to hear what your what were your thoughts about Justin Herbert and Jordan Love in the pre draft process too, because they were two names that were seen as potential destinations, and I know a lot of dolphin fans, specifically with Justin Herbert, were basically on the edge of their seat over Tua or Herbert at five when the draft was happening. Um, what do, what do you think about their skill sets before we get into more dolphin centric topics here? Well, I love Herbert's skill set. I mean, you you draw up a quarterback, what a quarterback's supposed to look like, and you got Jordan Her- Justin Herbert. I mean, he's tall, he's big, uh, he can throw the ball, he can move. But I hear him talk. I mean, he, just just him giving an interview, something as silly as him giving an interview at the combine. It was like, oh my god, are you kidding me? I mean, I mean, how can I say this politely? He could be the nicest guy in the world, but I mean, no personality. It was like like completely flatline. And I, I'm not really sure that that really works for a quarterback who's supposed to be the leader of your offense. I, I saw, and, and, and there's scouts who made the comparison of him to Ryan Tannehill. Uh, and I saw Ryan Tannehill for seven years and that was more than enough for me. And it was time to move on. I know he had a great year last year, but there were a lot of reasons for that beyond his play. Uh, even though I don't want to take any, I don't want to take everything away from him because he did play well, but Pieces were in place for him to succeed. Um, so that was the one thing that bothered him. About, bothered me about him is the personality. And if you talk about the quote unquote it factor, don't think Justin Herbert has it. Hmm. Uh, as, far, as far as Jordan Love, he, he's the kind of guy you can fall in love with because he's got, again, very prototypical size, big arm, can make some throws where you're shaking your head, but there's no consistency in the passing. Mm-hmm. So I would have been okay had the Dolphins, let's say, Selected somebody else at number five, say, oh, like Isaiah Simmons, who I absolutely love, and taken love, say, 18 or 26. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't been okay with that. Certainly not at five. I think it was maybe mentioned at one point that the Dolphins maybe would take love at five. That would have been way too high for me because, again, there's a bit, there's a big hit or miss factor over there. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, yeah, that's where I, I sit on those two. Hmm, I love it. Um, okay, let's stick with the draft for a sec. What were your thoughts? Because I know, again, a lot of scouts are torn on this player and a lot of Dolphin fans are torn on this player. What were your thoughts on the pick of Austin Jackson at 18? Did it seem to you kind of like, hey, the tackles are starting to fall off the board. We got to take them? Absolutely. I mean, you look at you look at the offensive line they had last year. I mean, wow, I, I was poor. Yeah. Uh, so... They, they had absolutely no choice. They needed to go heavy on the offensive line, which they did, um, starting with free agency with Flowers and Karras, and then tripling up in the, the draft with Jackson, Robert Hunt, and Solomon Kinley. But, again, it's a shame that the four – they were clearly four top-tier guys at offensive tackle, and they all they all went before the Dolphins, which was not unexpected. Mm. Uh, but And at that point – Again, if you look at if you listen to the scouts, everybody says he's got major, major upside. Even though it may take a little bit for him to get there, and if it does, no big deal. The, the, the thing is, you have to be right on the guy, and he has to become a player. 
Yeah, my whole, um, you know, my whole thing basically was, you know, when you look at Jedrick Wills and you look at Tristan Wirth specifically, to me, they're transcend. They look like athletically. Okay, athletically, I think Tristan works a little bit more than Jedrick Wills. Um, I was surprised. He was my offensive tackle one. They look like they had the potential to be transcendent right tackles. And my thing is, like, when you look at the draft this year, I don't see a right tackle deep draft with that kind of talent. Like, even a big guy I was a fan of um, was Lucas Niang from TCU, who ended up going to the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, he had a little bit of durability issues, but I think that guy could be, he has the potential, I think his ceiling could be the best tackle of that draft if he manages to stay healthy. That's my issue, I think, with 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 the draft was I love Robert Hunt, but um Alan, I, I watch a lot of film, I grade players, et cetera, et cetera. I'm one of those type of people. I had Robert Hunt more of a guard than I did as a tackle coming out. And my issue with that is. I, I love what I – don't get me wrong. I love what I saw at Louisiana Lafayette, especially in that Appalachian State game, consistently getting to the second level, clearing out run lanes after he's chipping off, after he's chipping off a defensive tackle, getting that second level, blowing up the linebacker right out of the run lane. I love to see that type of thing. Shows me IQ. He had a violent streak, et cetera, et cetera. I just don't know if he's athletic enough to protect – to uh, the future's blind side, whether that's this year or next year. I don't know if he's going to be athletic enough at the next level. That's something to be seen. And I think that was my issue with it. Like, you know, even with Austin Jackson, I really feel like Cesar Ruiz, I think is going to be a pro bowler year one. And I think we could have used him. You know what I mean? I think we could have slotted him out to right guard, kicked him out to right guard. He would have been perfectly fine because that looks what the Saints are doing. And Larry Warford, a three-time Pro Bowler, became expendable because of Cesar Ruiz. So my, my whole thing with Austin Jackson is I get the pick. I get that he's 20 years old. It's a scary thing when you look at his size that he hasn't even gained that grown man strength. So he doesn't even have his true anchor strength yet. That's a scary thing for his size. I love how he moves into his run sets, pass sets. I've said this before. He glides into them like a player on skates. Um, but my thing is, I just think he could have been there at 26. You know what I mean? And I get reaching and I feel like they did that again with Brandon Jones. And I want to get your thought on this. Did you feel when 70 came around after Ashton Davis had gone off the board right to the jets? And I know we have Gerald Alexander there who coached um, Ashton Davis at Cal, you know, um, so he might've been a perfect fit. Um, you know, McKinney was gone. All those guys were gone. Do you, what do you think about the Brandon Jones pick at 70? Because I know that's another pick where a lot of people are like, okay, we get it. He looks like he might be um, Eric Rose future replacement, but would, did that stick out to you again as a pick where, okay, the safeties are flying off the board. We got to get a safety. Uh, I, I would say at that point of the draft, probably not, because I don't know that they that they absolutely had to have a safety uh, mm -hmm. at that spot. Uh, and you mentioned he may become Eric Crow's replacement. He may he may become Bobby McCain's replacement. Um, I think they like Brandon Jones' versatility. That he's a guy who can do a lot of different things, and that's. I mean, we keep hearing that that term, and yeah. it's almost almost to the point of nausea how often we hear the term versatile, versatile, versatile. Well, mm -hmm. he can play a little nickel. He can play safety. He can return punts. He's very good on special teams, very good tackler. He's got great intangibles, if you, if you know his story with his dad passing away when he was very young and then taking over, kind of raising his, his brothers, and then what he did for the young cancer patient in, in Texas. I mean, he's a great kid. And again, he can do a lot of different things. So I don't think it was necessarily we have to have a safety as opposed to there's a lot of things to like about that guy and we're getting him in the third round. So why not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Cause when I watched him, he was phenomenal out of the slot when he was in, when he, like I, I, some of his best work was definitely out of that slot. Um, and I agree. And that's another thing, um, you know, even when they went into the UDFA pool, Alan, Look at a guy like Donald Stanley. He's not only a center, but he can play guard. It's like, you know, look at Raekwon. Not only can play the zero tech, he can play three tech. He can stand up if you want. Like, is that what – let's talk about Minka for a sec because I know a lot of people were heated over that thing and that segue oh. – yeah, right into that versatility thing and him kind of being stubborn about wanting to play that free safety spot. Do, is this a thing where they're going to – they're going to verse – they would rather have a guy who's – really solid at multiple positions as opposed to someone who's really great at one? Mm, I, I don't know. Um, 
I'm talking about like yeah. the secondary. I'm talking about secondary. No, no, yeah, I understand. And and I know and I know Brian Flores is like completely big, huge on versatility. Uh, I think if you have, for example, X, I don't think they're they're gonna ask X to play safety anytime soon, assuming he's healthy, of course. Um no, and then you, you mentioned the Minka thing, which which is highly regrettable and it's it's a move that often they're going to wind up regretting at some point, one way or another. Uh, you can blame whoever you want to blame. Uh, the story that just came out in Bleacher Report about what Mika had to say wasn't exactly painting a nice picture for the for the Dolphins. Uh, but the problem is, it's not good business to trade away really, really good players early in their contract uh, because you can't you resolve differences that you have. Um, but going going back to your initial question. Yeah, absolutely. If, if it's even close, Flores is going to go and the Dolphins are going to go for the player who has versatility. I don't believe they would turn away somebody who's a great talent just because he can only do one thing. Okay. Um, and just sticking with Minka for a sec here, because I, I was absolutely amazed. Dolphins Twitter went turned upside down yesterday after that Minka article came back. You saw fans going at each other, taking sides. It was absolutely ridiculous. I just want to do you think we'll ever hear Brian Flores' side of it? Or is, do you think it's one of, he's that type of guy where he's like, let Minka say whatever he's going to say. we got football games to win and we got a team to focus on. Correct. I don't believe that's that's in his nature to really go back and forth. Uh, they kind of addressed it. Even, even after the trade was made, it was basically – there was really no explanation. We just felt it was best for all parties to move on and all that. So I'd be shocked. Uh, if we ever got a, a full explanation from Flores. In fact, the, the Bleacher story indicated that uh, the writer reached out to the Dolphins to see if, the, if yep. Flores wanted to come in, and he did not want to do so. So I, I don't see any reason for him to do that and, at this point. And final on this topic, if we, just your opinion. If we had Minka Fitzpatrick, would we have the best secondary in the AFC? It'd be, it'd be up there. The, the, the Patriots secondary is awfully good. I mean, I know they lost Chung, but – with with Gilmore and the, the, the McCourty twins, Jonathan Jones is a very good third cornerback. Uh, I, I forget who's going to play. Well, now they got Kyle Duggar, the second round pick, rookie second round pick. He's I'm assuming he's going to play a big role at safety. Also, it would be awfully close as it stands right now. And again, Buffalo also has a very good secondary. The one thing Buffalo doesn't have is a great second corner. But I think Tre'Davious White, I to me, is just as good as Stephon Gilmore, even though he doesn't get nearly quite the attention that Gilmore does. Mm -hmm. um, let's keep to the secondary for a sec. I wanted to get your thoughts on Noah Igbenogany and Nick Needham. Um, Noah Igbenogany, when we drafted him, I, I, you know, my my thought process was, you know, maybe, you know, maybe he'll gain his legs and get his experience in that first year, maybe out of the nickel um, in the slot. Um, I just think, you know, if you, I know you probably watched up on him a little bit. He had problems at times. You know, he's a little handsy especially against Van Jefferson, against the Gators. Um, he, he also, you know, he needs to learn to turn his head back a little bit more before that ball gets there. Um, and Nick Needham showed us a lot last year. Like there were times where, you know, he took that CB1 role and he took the weight of the world and, and he showed up and he locked down at times last year. How do you see the battle for that corner three working out between Nick Needham and Noah Igbegnogany? And do you think – the smart move would probably be for Noah Ibnogany to really get his chops in that slot in the first year. That's exactly where I would would imagine he would line line up. If you also remember from last year, the one who played the most at the slot position to look at the numbers in terms of starts it might have been Jamal Wilson, who's now Jamal Perry, <laughs> um, and he he had his struggles. And I think the Dolphins won an upgrade over there. And I think this is where Ibnogany fits in. Uh, and Needham would be the first guy, the first backup on the outside. Now, the big X factor in all of this, pun intended, is X, because X is still on PUP, and now on top of that, he's on the reserve COVID list. Um, ideally, there's no issue, and X is ready for the start of the regular season, but this is a guy who had a, uh, who I believe, what was referred to as at least a third knee operation last December, and the fact that he started on PUP is a little bit troublesome. Um, so Dolphins may have, may have some adjusting to, to do over there in an ideal world, 
You have Byron Jones on one side. You have X on the other side. You have Nick Needham as the first guy behind those two on the boundary. And I think you have Benogany starting in the slot. I got to ask you this. Sticking with X, do you, in your heart of hearts, uh, just your opinion, do you think we're going to see a full season from him? And do you think even if we do, it's going to take a little bit of time for him to get back, if he can, to that 2018 form? I'd, I'd be lying to you if I said I had any clue. I mean, it, it, everything is kept pretty tightly under wraps. We saw him early in in the preseason, put on Instagram a, a workout of himself, yeah. like on the comeback trail or something along those lines. In his garage, right? In his garage, yeah. And then and then training camp starts. He's, in, he's on PUP, which, again, it's, it's troublesome. There's no question about it. Um, yeah, it would be great if he got back to 2018 because he was really, really good that year. And then last year, even before he got hurt, uh, it was kind of rough. But the circumstance, circumstances were kind of weird though, all the way around. I mean, here's, here's like one really star player on a team that's basically resetting, restarting, trading away a lot of high-profile established guys. Um, and he's just signed his big contract. So you put all those factors together. And I'm not saying like, like he – and I hate that phrase, tanked it, but um, – Maybe it's human nature and subconsciously, perhaps you're off your game a little bit to begin with. Uh, and, of course, there were some highlights, him against Amari Cooper, where it didn't show well, where he got done a double move and it kind of jogged a little bit trying to catch up after Cooper. So, But I wouldn't put too much talk into what happened last year. The big concern with him is the health. So let me ask you this, um, because I know you hear it a lot, you know, it doesn't matter what team. So let's use it in the sense of the Miami Dolphins. You know, if Flores didn't draft you, if he basically adopted you when he took over the team, you know, you're not a, like you're technically not a Flores guy, right? Like he didn't draft you, et cetera, et cetera. Now, obviously it looks like Jerome Baker is on his good side and has turned into a Flores guy. Alan Hearns looks like he's a Flores guy. Do you think, you know, Tankersley wasn't a Flores guy. They obviously said, this guy's not going to get healthy. We're going to cut bait. We know how talented X can be. There's no question about that. But do you think there's going to be a certain level of patience that that can be breached with Flores when he puts up his hand and said, you know what, enough is enough. You know, he's just taking up a roster spot. He's just eating up money. Cut bait with it. Like, if, if we don't see him play a full season again, do you think this is turning – and I don't like to use – because X has earned it. I don't want to use the term – like leash, like how short of a leash. I don't want to use that term because X has earned my respect where I don't want to say that. But do you, so that's what I'll say. Do you think the patience level is going to be very short with him if he has yet another season where he doesn't see all 16 games? Um, well, there's, at some point it's going to be an issue. Yeah, I, I mean, how much can we rely on the guy to be able to stay healthy? If, again, there's issues in terms of that this season – the other factor with X is you got to look at his contract. If I'm not mistaken, I believe uh, letting him go either this year, or the next year, or next year would be completely egregious to where he's basically uncuttable. And I think two years down the road, maybe 2022, I think becomes more reasonable. More reasonable, if I remember correctly, the numbers looking at his contract. But as you mentioned, yes, he 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 bought himself a lot of goodwill with that performance in 2018. And you talk about guys not being Flores guys. But also, if you're really, really good, doesn't take much to become a Flores guy. I agree. Um, so, again, the, the key with him is is what's his health going to be like and how quickly will he be available and able to get back to that 2018 form. Mm -hmm. So, um, what are your expectations for the front seven? I know we added Emmanuel Ogba, who I think played it smart because I think – you know, he only signed a two-year deal. I think he's going to be able to cash in. I really, I, he's, I expect a lot of things from Emmanuel Ogba if he can stay healthy. Um, the Kyle Van Noy signing, I think, was absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, Shaq Lawson, a good signing. But then the draft picks, you know, you saw the fist pump with Raekwon Davis. He was a player who pre-draft this channel we highlighted as a player, you know, next to Tua. Raekwon was on our must-have list. Um, how do you see how that front seven performing and how much do you think it has improved with even the UDFA is like, you know, they brought in a pure nose tackle like Benito Jones. Um, they brought in um, Braden Bryant today. How do you see that front seven play improving this year? 
Well, it's got to be better. I mean, again, we talk about the offensive line not being very good last year. Well, the front seven wasn't great either, if we're, if we're being honest. The one thing that still concern me, concerns me about this team is I don't see a stud pass rusher on this team. Now, I know if you look at the New England model, which is what this defense looks like it's built on, which is really, really strong on the back end and built from the back end, um, you still have to have a guy who rushes the passer very well. And Shaq Lawson is more of a 4-3 defensive end than he is a 3-4 outside linebacker. Uh, even though he does have an experience in that in that system as well. Um, Agba's a signing I like, but I, I, my concern, again, is who is going to be that pass rusher who's going to get it done on a consistent basis and not necessarily put up sack numbers, but get to the quarterback, affect the passer. Mm. Uh, I think you need for Gottschow and Christian Wilkins to take a step up, uh, even though they were both solid last year. But if you want to become a really good defense, they need to be more than just solid. Um I love. I'm with you. I love the signing of Kyle Van Noy. I think that might have been just as good a signing as Byron Jones because he you can do so many things with him. We talk about versatile. Uh, he's a guy who can do a lot of different things on that defense. Uh, and then the, the question is going to be who else is going to emerge at linebacker? They have a lot of different options linebacker. I really like what I saw from Van Ginkle late last year. Mm-hmm. Um, he showed. He, I mean, he showed me some uh, some jump off the line of scrimmage. I also like Zach Sealer. Mm-hmm. Uh, late last season after they picked them up from Baltimore. So they have a lot of pieces, but again, not a whole lot of proven commodities, especially when it comes to rushing the passer. Agreed. Um, another guy I actually, I like to, I think, might take a step forward this year is Vince Beagle. Looks like they might have some big plans for him. But let me ask you about, because, you know, a lot of, when we were in the top five, because there was a portion where we were sitting with that third pick and even that fourth pick before we settled on fifth, right? So a lot of people were talking about trade up for Chase Young. You know, I know... A lot of the talk, if you remember back correctly, around October, November, a lot of people had AJ Epinesa in the top 15, even hovering around that 10 pick. And I'm not lying to you, Alan. Last October, I mean, I got the receipts. I was banging the table and said, forget about AJ Epinesa. Go get Curtis Weaver. And I think he was one of the biggest steals of this draft. Do you think – I know rookies go through that learning curve, so I'm not going to put that pressure on them. Do you think in two to three years – he could be that stand-up guy in this four, th- in this three-four, coming off that edge. That could be getting us that pass rush that you were talking about. It'd be nice. Um, the the thing about him too, and if you look at the scouting reports and you, and you watch his tape too, it's the same thing. There's nothing about him that really jumps out, and you go, "Wow." Um, he, I mean. Certainly, certainly not in a position to shame anybody, but even physique-wise, he doesn't look like a great pass rusher. Yeah. Um, he's not particularly fast. He's not particularly strong. And yet, what was it, 34 and a half sacks in three seasons at Boise State? That's really impressive. The thing that concerns you, given how valuable pass rushers are and his production in college, no team saw fit to pick him until the fifth round. Mm-hmm. Um no, were the Dolphins really wise and everybody else missed out on this guy? I mean, who knows? Um, it would be nice if he developed into that kind of guy. I think I think the idea of looking at his college production and assuming that he's going to be that kind of guy in the NFL might be a little bit over optimistic. Uh, in terms of a learning curve, pass rusher is the one thing. It's basically, okay, you line up, you see the quarterback, go get him. Um, so we'll see. Well, I think we'll get a pretty good feel right away as to what kind of pass rusher he can become in the NFL. And it's a 50, 50 proposition. You'll, you'll become one, but, but again, t- taking him in the fifth round. I mean, if he doesn't pan out, it's still a great shot to take anyway. Like, do you think the, um, so, you know, we were talking about, you know, pass rushers, basically what, what you, I guess what you're implying was, you know, pin your, pin your ears back and go get them. Right. Do you think a problem with players like that coming into it is, Brian Flores kind of asks more in terms of responsibility wise of rather than just pin years back and go like, you know, perfect example. I'm not saying Chase Young wouldn't have fit none of that, but I'm saying, you know, Chase Young, the guy who, when you watch his tape, that's basically all he was asked to do his whole career. Pin years back. He wasn't asked to go into the flats, wasn't asked to coverage, wasn't asked any to move around, shift around. Um, do you think that's the problem too? Because not only do you got to find a guy who can pin his ears back and go, but you got to find a guy who's responsible in different areas as an end. Yeah, but by the same token, you can make the argument that you can have specialists as well. Mm-hmm. And that 
based on everything I know of Curtis Weaver, what he does is rush the passer. I don't think he's, I don't know how much dropping into coverage he did at Boise State. I don't believe it's a whole lot, if any. I don't know what kind of a run defender he was. I don't believe it's anything that really stood out. What he did is rush the passer. So this is where, this is where as a head coach and as a defensive staff, you have to be flexible and realize this is a guy who has one particular skill and his skill is rushing the passer. If you wanted a guy who could do a lot of different things, this is where I mentioned Isaiah Simmons. Mm -hmm. To me, I, I liked him for the Dolphins at five because uh, while I understand picking Tua because, again, it's been so long since there's been a franchise quarterback here, I, if Isaiah Simmons doesn't scream a perfect Brian Flores type of defender because of everything he can do for a defense, I don't know who does. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're talking about rushing the passer. Let's talk about a passer that was added to the AFC East. What are your thoughts on Cam Newton to the Patriots? Yeah. Um, not surprising, and actually, um, I don't want to. Dep depressing is too strong a word, but it would have been nice if he hadn't been there because I think Ken Newman, if he's right, he's really, really good. Uh, and Jared Stidden, no matter how much they talk him up in New England, doesn't really strike fear into me. Maybe I'll be proven wrong and he'll become another Tom Brady and I'll look stupid. But for at this moment, Jared, Jared Stidham doesn't, doesn't scare me in the least if I'm an AFC East opponent. Cam Newton again, and, they, and I, I looked it up before he started having injury problems like late in the 2018 season. His passer rating up to that point, I think it was through 11 games or 12 games, actually was higher than the season he got MVP. So it's not as if his game was really declining. He was still really, really good, and just he's battled injuries for the past year and a half. Now, having said that, it's possible because he's not getting any younger that maybe injuries are catching up and his body's breaking down a little bit and he'll continue to have injury issues. But if he stays healthy, he makes New England a problem again. Although if we're going to be thorough about this, the fact that they lost eight players who opted out to COVID, including some key guys like Dante Hightower, that's something they're going to have to overcome. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you this because I actually did a deep dive in this because when he got signed, um, and I, you know, I realized 2018 was his best season. But when I, you know, when I when I dove into a little bit of the analytics, um, you know, 775 yards of Cam's 3,395 3, came from Christian McCaffrey. That's about 22.8 percent. Um, six of his 24 passing TDs, which is 25 percent, came from Christian McCaffrey. 95 of his 320 completions, which is almost 30 percent, was to Christian McCaffrey in 2018. And he also had North Turner, I believe that year. So this is why I, I do you see James? What? Like I, I see, this is where I, where I kind of part ways with people on this, because my thing is I get how James white is utilized in that offense, but I don't think James white is as dynamic. I think Christian McCaffrey personally, Christian McCaffrey is the best player in the NFL. The only thing he can't do is, you know, play center basically on an, on the offense, um, you know, or guard. So when I look at Christian McCaffrey, um, you know, do, where do you see him finding that production? Because, you know, he wasn't pushing the ball down the field. You know, he's really keeping it to the short and intermediate levels in 2018. You know, it was a lot, it was a very rhythmic, quick, get the ball out of your hands offense that year under North term, which is kind of what Josh McDaniels does a little bit too. Um, do you see him being able to have that kind of production again without a dynamic player like Christian McCaffrey? Because the weapons around him, I mean, we could make the argument that the best player around him is probably Joe Tooney, right? The, the left guard. So, so do you see him being able to even replicate um, that 2018 season in any way, shape or form with the kind of weapons that Belichick and company are providing him? I don't know about replicate. I think he can have success as well because I think James White is a very, very, very good receiving running back. Uh, he may not be Christian McCaffrey, certainly not as a as a runner, but as a receiver, he, he's not Christian McCaffrey either, but he's not that far behind. He's really, really good. Uh, and New England finds a way. I mean, the other dimension – before, when you when you face New England, you never had to worry about Tom Brady taking out, you know, taking off from the pocket. Now you have that dimension again, assuming that his body holds up. Uh, so no, I don't think I would dismiss Cam because he doesn't have Christian McCaffrey with him this year. I think that would be foolish.
Do you think he has enough weapons around him to be successful? To be to be successful, yeah. Julian Edelman's a very very good possession receiver. So if you're if you're not a if the idea is to not ask Cam to throw the ball down the field uh, with Julian Edelman and James White, that's a very good one to one two punch in terms of, of players who can catch passes short and intermediate routes. So what are you, when you look at the the landscape of the AFC East? What are your expectations right now for the Dolphins when you look at the roster, what they're going up against in the Bills, um, the Jets, and the New England Patriots? Well, I think to me that there are two completely clear scenarios as I see it. I see Buffalo first and I see the Jets last. Um, I happen to think that if Josh Allen progresses the way I think he's going to progress, I think the Bills are good enough to, to go to the Super Bowl. I am – very, very bullish on the Bills, mm -hmm. uh, pun intended. <laughs> I, I think they're completely stacked. Not only not only that, they're really, really deep at a lot of different positions, except for quarterback, uh, because if Josh Allen gets hurt, they have Matt Barkley behind him, and that's not going to get it done. Come but, on, Jake, Jake Fromm, Alan. Come on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, glad you didn't, I'm glad you didn't ask me about him when we were talking about quarterbacks coming out last year, man. Because yeah, here's no. the thing. No, here's the thing with him though. You put Justin Herbert's physical tools with Jake Fromm's like Moxie yeah. and and this, yeah, and you have yeah. you have a you have a Hall of Famer. But Jake Fromm, hundred and ten percent, hundred and ten percent. I agree with you. I mean, I have an eleven year old son, and he might have a better arm than Jake Fromm. I mean, and and <laughs> and no, and, and the funniest part is probably the one team in the entire NFL that requires a strong arm for a quarterback because of the wins in that stadium is Buffalo and it's Buffalo that winds up taking Jake from. So uh, anyway, I, I love, I love Buffalo though. I think they're, I mean, they're stacked. I love them top to bottom. I had secondary, I mentioned tribute to Davis White, Tremaine Edmonds, mm -hmm. son of a former Dolphins is an outstanding player. Uh, Matt Milano is a very good linebacker. Their their front four is really really good. Their offensive lines are really solid. They added Stephon Diggs at wide receiver to go on the opposite side of John Brown, who completely killed the Dolphins last year. Um, no, I, I I love Buffalo a lot, and the Jets are not <laughs> not not in not in good shape. Not not a whole lot to, to get crazy about there, unless unless Adam Gase works miracles with Sam Darnold. And I don't see it. I, I wasn't a huge fan of Sam Darnold coming out of USC, and nothing that's happened in the past uh, two years has changed my mind. Uh, so it comes down to New England and the Dolphins. It, it, like, like I said, New England lost an awful lot of players who opted out. That's going to hurt them. But, again, picking against Bill Belichick is really always a risky proposition. Uh, the Dolphins are much, much, much better in terms of talent than they were last year. Uh, but they're still not great. I mean – Let's be honest, they, they have some shortcomings in a lot of different areas. We like what they've done along the offensive line, but who on that offensive line is a guy who's really an established starter with, let's say, a resume of success of more than one year? Mm -hmm. Really nobody. Um, and you could go the same. Is there, is there really a front-line defensive lineman on that team? Not really. Uh, the strength of that team is a secondary by far. And then at that spot, you have one guy with a major question mark. So my inclination would be I think the Dolphins are going to are going to be better how that translates into the win one loss record I don't know but I I think it's logic would say that they'll finish behind Buffalo and New England. Yeah, I caught a lot of heat on this channel when that schedule came out and I said that I think we're going to lose two to Buffalo. I caught a lot of heat, you know, um you know, you even look at the running back room, Devin Singletary and Zach Moss as a one-two mm -hmm. punch. I don't yeah. think Dolphin fans realize what they're in store for with that one-two punch because Zach Moss is just – he sheds tackles like it's nobody's business. And Devin Singletary, man, he looked – he flashed last year. I mean, mm -hmm. he flashed. So um, I, I'm totally in agreement with you. Um, again, same with you. I've always been telling people I can't bet against, against Belichick whether it's Stidham, Hoyer – or Cam Newton. I just can't because, you know, I know they lost Danny Shelton. I know they lost Van Noy. I know they lost Jamie Collins, um, you know, in that front seven. But I just – it's Bill Belichick, man. You can, you just can't bet against him. Um, right. What what are your thoughts um, in terms of sticking to the Dolphins? Do you think Devon Godshaw might price himself out of town? Uh, he might. I I, I... – I'm not clued in on what his expectations are in terms of, of the salary, but I, I think 
Um, I think he's a he's a he's a decent solid player. I don't think he's somebody who's gonna, who should think he's going to be commanding a huge salary on the open market. And on in this particular scheme, the defensive linemen, I don't want to say they're interchangeable, but they're almost interchangeable. So I, I think if his, his financial demands are, are not, I don't want to say modest, but if they're not reasonable, uh, yeah, I, I could see him, this being his last year. And what are your thoughts about Christian Wilkins? Um. He, he, he was a rookie last year. He did some good things. He showed some flashes. Um, maybe didn't make the impact that I was kind of hoping that he would make. Uh, but again, and I hate to keep going back to that, but the defensive linemen in that scheme don't necessarily stand up. If you, as an example, I will, I will ask you, name me a great New England defensive lineman uh, of the past several years. Who's the last great one you can think of, Richard Seymour? I mean, that's mm -hmm. been a while. Chandler uh, Jones for a short period, I guess. Well, yeah. Chandler, Chandler Jones was more of a linebacker. Uh, though. Line side linebacker, yeah. Um, Vince Wilfork's the one. Yeah. Uh, also, well, Vince Wilfork was 340 pounds. Mm -hmm. Dolphins don't, don't have that guy. I think the guy who could be closest to that maybe is Raekwon Davis, even though he doesn't have the tip prototypical nose cycle body because he's so tall. Um, so I think maybe my expectations of Christian Wilkins may have been a little bit too high last year when he came in. Um, but there was no – I'm not sure there was a there was a wow factor there, but as I said, he was solid. And for that defense, it's going to be tough for those interior linemen, Wilkins and Gottschow, to really make a lot of splash plays. In fact, Wilkins did a Zoom media session last week, and he said one of the things that he realized about playing in the NFL is the big difference from college was it's so much harder to make splash plays. And that particular step absolutely is true, and it's also tougher – to make splash plays when you play in a 3-4 alignment, as opposed to, say, a 4-3, whereas an Aaron Donald from the Rams can make an awful lot of plays from the defensive tackle spot. Hmm. So um, let's switch gears a little bit back to the offensive side. Um, I, I got to ask, you know, given the circumstances of COVID right now, um, given that there's no preseason games, given that – Ryan Fitzpatrick, um, you know, he knows what Flores as a head coach expects. Um, his familiarity, obviously, in his relationship with Chan Gailey, um, his five years of experience in Chan Gailey's offense. Um, who would you hedge your bet on starting week one? And if it's Fitzpatrick, should fans that are going to try and paint a narrative that, oh, my God, Tua couldn't beat out Fitzpatrick, do they kind of need to pump the brakes and just look at the context of the situation right now? Yeah, the term I would use is they need to just chill. Um, seriously, come on. Um, the the uh, the percentages I would give you, I would probably tell you it'd be, I don't know, somewhere around 80, 20 Fitzpatrick will start. If not, if not more slanted than that, because the, here's the thing. You drafted Tua with the idea he's going to be your starting quarterback, your franchise quarterback for ideally 10 years, 12 years. There's no rush. Mm -hmm. Get him in there when he's completely ready, both physically and in terms of understanding and being able to, to master the offense. Now, having said that, if he goes out and the padded practices start next Monday, if he goes out and completely lights it up in practice for three weeks straight, and he gives he basically gives you no choice, and then you'd be stupid not to not to go ahead and play him. But if there's even even a shadow of a doubt, it's not like Fitzpatrick was terrible last year. Fitzpatrick actually was very good last year. Mm -hmm. um, and beyond the fact that he was team MVP, I mean, the guy was playing with uh, what was what was very generously could be described as a talent deficient offense, and he he, he got some production. So. There's no reason to rush to a um, – and if he lights it up and is, is sensational and from the start, then obviously play him. But, uh, and, again, could that happen? Sure. But mm -hmm. lo lo logically, no. Yeah, one of the things me and my co-host is normally here, we highlight about – we all we believe Fitzpatrick's going to start. Um, we've been pretty adamant in that. We think he – you know, we know the NFL is a what have you done for me lately – but, you know, you add on with what he did at the end of the year, he kind of, you know, you could make the argument that, you know, he put the nail in the Patriots dynasty and then Tannehill in the first round just kicked it into the six-foot hole. Um, with Ryan Fitzpatrick, um, you know, what are your thoughts 
when you look at him and, you know, a lot of people go, you know, we'll get into Josh Rosen in a second here. A lot of people talk about Josh Rosen and, you know, they stick to the drops. That's their hope of those are the flashes we saw, the Preston Williams drops. You know, Fitzpatrick had 31 drops and he still managed to finish, which was fifth most in the NFL. And he still managed to fit, finish with the eighth best QBR in the NFL. When you look at what he did, you know, when, when he came back in, it was clear he had started to grasp this complicated Chad O'Shea offense that everyone's talked about since he's left. Were you surprised, not so much about how he won games, but the one thing me and my co-host noticed was the structure in his game. He wasn't turning the ball over like we've seen in the past. Were, were you surprised at the structure you saw in his game in terms of the turnovers? And then do you think that's something he can carry on into the season? Because it's clearly something, obviously, Brian Flores stresses, Brian Flores stresses to his players, not just his quarterback. Yeah, and I, and I think another factor in his improvements uh, through the course of the season was the offensive line got a little bit better. The offensive line, again, as a whole throughout the year was not good. Mm -hmm. But in the first, let's say, month or so of the season, it was frightening. Mm -hmm. And then it got serviceable, I would say, as the weeks went by. And that helped everybody, including Fitzpatrick. Mm -hmm. And let's also not forget, Fitzpatrick two years ago in Tampa Bay was very good. Yeah, he was he was streaky. He had a streak where he played poorly, but for the most part, I believe his passer rating was over 100, which is which is, I mean, high territory right there. So, and interestingly enough, Fitzpatrick told us that he, he's felt like he's getting better and better as a quarterback as the years go by, and uh, the numbers actually kind of back him up. And maybe his career arc, even though he's never reached quite the same level as the other guy, but his career arc maybe a little bit like that of a Rich Cannon, for example were very, very, very late bloomer and was playing his best football when in his mid to late 30s. And maybe that's what we're seeing with Fitzpatrick. So I no, I don't see any reason why he should be able to pick up where he did last year. And I think the offensive line play logically will be better from the start. Although the fact that they might have four, three or four, maybe possibly even five, even though I don't think so. I think Jesse Davis will still start, but they, let's say they'll have four new starters on the offensive line and trying to build that cohesiveness in this particular offseason is not going to make it easy for the offensive line to come out of the uh, come out of the, the gates like playing as well as they can play. It's funny you mentioned Rich Gannon because that's exactly who me and my co-host have actually um, used as the comparison. Um, you, you guys are very smart. I mean, that, you know, what was he? He was 37 or 38 when he had that MVP season, right? Yeah. Um, we're not saying he's going to have, have an MVP, but, you know, you saw that resurgence, and he was kind of a journeyman and up until that. So, I, I, Alan, I absolutely love you. Great minds think alike. I love it. Um, what are your – let's shift to the wide receiver room because beyond um, Jakeem Grant, Devontae Parker, you know, a lot of people want to see Preston take that step forward coming back from that injury. Um, I want to get specifically your thoughts on Kirk Merritt because I've been driving since we signed him. I've been driving um, the bandwagon for him. I absolutely, his, I think he's an absolute athletic freak. And I think he's one of those guys where, you know, even if you can't find a spot for him in that receiving core, you've got to find a spot on him for the roster because, he, I mean, even in the return game, the things he could offer you with that athleticism. What are your thoughts? We know pretty much who the top dogs are going to be in that receiver room. What are your thoughts about like the five, six, seven spot with guys like Gary Jennings, Kirk Merritt, Matt Cole, Isaiah Ford, um, those type of names? Where, where do you, and even with some of the new additions like Chester Rogers, who do you see winning out that five, six, seven, those last couple spots on this team? Well, not going to be seven. I can tell you that. Um, wow, that's a, man, it's a tough question. So we're assuming Parker, Grant, Williams are three of them. Yeah. Um, wow. That's a great question. Can I punt on that question? I, I, I It's going to depend. No, this is a, an opportunity because here's what you have. Like, for example, the, the, the scouting report on Chester Rogers is he's got some ability, can play the slot, but he's got problems with dropsies. Mm -hmm. with dropsies. Uh, you look at Isaiah. Isaiah is a guy who does everything right. He's a great team player, great kid. Uh, but is there anything special about him physically? Or you go with a Mac Collins, who the Dolphins got from the Eagles last year, who's got some ability, but it's kind of like unproven, doesn't have really the numbers. And this is where is this where maybe you take a shot on a guy who's 
who's new but has a maybe higher upside, just a, a, a la Kirk Merritt, a la Matt Cole, the kid from McKendry, the Division II school in Chicago. So I, I wish I could t tell you that I have a strong feeling for how they would lean. Uh, it's it's going to come down to how – how people look on the practice field in the next couple of weeks. I, I don't think they're like major favorites. I can tell you that Isaiah Ford scored a lot of points with the way he played down the stretch late mm -hmm. last year. Um, and I think he may have secured a spot there because if you're looking for dependability, he's a very dependable guy. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think if I read Brian Flores's mindset as I well, as well as I think I do, I think he'd prefer a guy who's really dependable and you know what you're going to get out of him than, let's say a, a, a Kirk Merrick, to use him as an example, who may have higher upside and who may, if things work out, become a better player, but there's a lot more unknown. Uh, so I think Ford would be for Gary Jennings. Again, it's he obviously was a fourth round pick out of West Virginia for a reason. So there's ability there. He just never got the chance to show it for the Dolphins because in his first game with the team, he like blew out a knee and on the opening kickoff. So Obviously, it's going to depend on what he shows on the practice field. I would think they'd like to see what they have there. Uh, but it, as far as trying to predict who it's going to be, that's that's really, really difficult. Okay. Um, then I'll, I'll throw this one at you. Do you think Gusecki, um, you know, last year he lined up in the slot and on the boundary more than any tight end in the NFL. Do you think with Hal and Hearns and specifically Albert Wilson going down, that he's going to see his usage increase and he's going to have a little bit more of a prominent role in the passing game this year? I would expect he would have the kind of role he had late in the year, like in the last five or six weeks where they really used him. Uh, and he also got a lot better at getting open, which was something else that helped. Uh, so I, that's his, what this is I would expect uh, for him. Uh He's got to continue doing what he did. I know he got a lot of praise from his coaches for putting in extra work at practice to work on his craft and develop his skill, and it really paid off. And he's another guy who's got to be a key on that offense along with Parker. We talk about him hopefully uh, picking up where he left off last year. Gisick is another one of those guys. But, uh, yeah, I would expect him to be a major factor in the offense, absolutely. Do you think um, Parker last year should have been a Pro Bowler and he was wrongfully snubbed? No, there's no question. The problem is that the Pro Bowl uh, – the Pro Bowl voting is done throughout the year or, or at some point. And the problem with Parker, he did a lot of his damage late in the year. Uh, I, I think by the time he completely torched Steve, Stephon Gilmore, the Pro Bowl vote was already over. So that didn't do him any good. And he also had a big game against the Eagles in December. And I think by that time he may have been like so far behind in terms of the national recognition uh, that there was no way for him to catch up. But if you look at his final numbers, I mean, he clearly belonged. And um, let's shift gears a little bit back to that quarterback position because I can only explain to you the headache and the absolute nonsense that has happened over Josh Rosen in terms of with this fan base. It is absolutely ridiculous um, the divide that this player has caused when – Really, he hasn't shown you any reason to divide anyone. What are your thoughts on Josh Rosen? Um, just to give me your overall thoughts, and we'll go from there. Like the guy, like him as a guy. Remember watching him from close up the first time at practice, and thinking to myself, "Man, that ball comes out of his hand nicely," mm -hmm. and thinking, "Oh, there, there's something to work to work with there." And then the preseason, the game started, and it's like. Josh, Josh, quick decision. De decide, decide, do something, do something. Um, and that's driven, that drove me nuts all of last year. Like he could not make it, make quick decisions in the pocket. And that completely killed him. Uh, and I'm not sure that's something you can teach, that internal clock. I know Ryan Tannehill had a big issue with that for a long time when he was here. He just would not make quick decisions. It's like everything has to be wide open in front of him before he makes – he makes his move, and I'm afraid that might be the same thing with with Josh, which is a shame because, like I said, he's got he I mean he's got a really nice arm, he throws a nice ball, and he's got the size and everything. But if he doesn't get that taken care of, they, he's gonna always gonna have some major issues. Yeah. So basically, what we're getting at is you really don't think he's where he, he's up to snuff where he needs to be as a processor. Correct? Is that basically what you would correct? Correct. Based on what I saw, but here's here's the thing. 
is after he was replaced in the Washington game, from that point on, practices were close to the media, so we never saw him. And so whatever progress he may have made on the practice field in terms of that particular skill, uh, which, again, generally is not something that you, that is taught, but may, it can be. I mean, it's not like it's never happened before. Uh, so whatever progress he might have made in that department, we don't know. We, we basically we, we asked Flores several occasions about his progress, and it was always a positive report. But then again, it's not like Flores is going to say, man, he's, he's still really slugging with that. So um, there, there was nothing said that wasn't unexpected. But the, the, the thing is, we just don't know. Did it feel more of like – because it really feels like – did it feel like it was given more – and I hate to put you on the spot like this. I mean, answer the best way you can. Did it feel more like you were given a public relations type of answer when it came to Josh Rosen? Um, you know, he's improving every day. Like, da 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 You know what I mean? Did it just feel like, you know, you were kind of getting, you know, like a written – like not a written statement, but, you know, kind of a – you know, this is the narrative we're going to go with, guys, when it comes to Josh Rosen. Because, I mean, I've talked about it all. I mean, something not a lot of people identify when it comes to quarterbacks enough is confidence. You know, you need confidence and to play that position, right? There's there's 32 coaches in the NFL. I would say at least 30 of them would give you the exact same answer. Yeah. Because, because they will not they will not criticize their players, mm -hmm. uh, mainly because for them it serves no purpose. Yeah. The the only way they'll do it, and I can tell you, a former Dolphin coach Jimmy Johnson would use the media to light fires under his players, um, but that's not done very much anymore. And nowadays, I, I mean, I look around the NFL really quickly. I mean, it, it would be really, really surprising to see a coach telling you like, "Yeah, he's still struggling. It's basically he's making progress. Still needs work." Is basically the answer you're going to get every time you ask that type of question. What? In terms of his future here, um, wh where do you see his future falling long term with the Miami Dolphins? He has no future long term with the Miami Dolphins, uh, unless unless that something happens this year and he's thrust into action and he really lights it up. I I can't imagine he's going to be here very long. I would think he'll be here all year because of this crazy situation we're dealing with, and you don't want to get caught short of a quarterback, so. I'd be very surprised if every team in the NFL did not keep three quarterbacks and he'd be the third one the Dolphins would keep beyond this year, though everything's fair game. And especially if anybody dangles a draft pick at the Dolphins in a trade possibility, um, who knows? But I don't think anything's going to happen this year. What are your thoughts on um, the one-two punch of Jordan Howard? And beyond that, what are your thoughts of Kalen Balazs? Uh, Kalen Balaj, man, he looked good in training camp last year. We were like, whoa, this guy, man, he looks good. Mm -hmm. And then the game, and then the game started and then it was like, whoo, man, he's rough. Um, thing with Balaj is you want to talk about looking the part. I mean, he's big, he is cut, he is fast, but he's fast in a straight line. He's got no jokes. And he doesn't break a whole lot of tackles. In fact, there's I saw an advanced stat which was frightening. He broke one tackle and 74 rushing attempts last year, which was the lowest number actually for any but any running back who had more than I believe was 40 carries. So um, here, here's the, here's the deal: the Dolphins are going to look at him in training camp. If he were if he were to be cut before September 13th, I would not be shocked. Uh, because again, you're looking at a guy. He behaved, yeah, he had that 75 yard touchdown against Minnesota as a rookie, but it was basically one cut and a lot of open room, and then he cannot run the defenders. But the, the ability to run in traffic and create holes and then break tackles that's got to count as well. So I think he's to say he's at a crossroads would be putting him mildly. As far as what the Dolphins have in their one two combination, I like it. Uh, I mean, I like Kenyon Drake too. Last year, it's it's a shame it never worked out with him here and could never really get coaches enamored with him. Uh, but in terms of what they wound up, I, I like I like the combination. It's a good 
I hate to use the cliche of thunder and lightning, but that's what it is. You got the physical guy with Howard. You got the speedy guy with Bredo. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a good one-two punch. I kind of wish – I kind of was hoping the Dolphins would actually use all that draft capital they had to maybe get one of those second-round running backs, say a J.K. Dobbins, to set themselves up for a few years, but it didn't work out that way. But at least Matt Breda was a good consolation prize if you want to look at it like that. Mm -hmm. So – um, just going back to Balage for a sec, based on what you saw last year in training camp, being around the team, would you be more willing – and performance last year, obviously. Would you be more willing to invest in a guy at, like Patrick Laird or Miles Gaskin as your third guy behind um, your one-two combo? Uh, I mean, it may be. Uh, I think, again – we're going to go back to dependability. Belage also had issues with drop passes. In mm -hmm. terms of physical ability, there's not a comparison between those three guys. I mean, Belage is a whole level, if not two, in terms of pure athletic ability over Gaskin and Laird. But I, th I think at that spot, especially as a third guy, I think where you're looking, dependability has got to be a big factor as well. So I would think if the Dolphin coaches see in Balage and training camp some of the same traits or some of the name negative things that we saw in the regular season last year, I think they'd be inclined to go with one of the other two guys. To you, because this is a saying I go with, so I just want your opinion on this. To you, is Kalen Balage falling in the category more of an athlete who's a football player as opposed to a football player that's an athlete? Uh, and I asked that because, you know, my co-host too goes on about his athletic profile and I agree, you know, what he says, you know, athletically, he might be the most athletic guy in the room, but when you look about the intangibles of, you know, vision, creating, finding holes by yourself, you know, I've said all the time, he basically needs, Mo he basically needs Moses to walk on the field and use his staff and part the line like the Red Sea. And that's how he's going to hit holes. Um, so intangible wise, you know, that's why, you know, do you think that kind of makes sense where he looks like he's more of an athlete than correct, athlete yeah, correct. football player really? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Okay. Um, and uh, so just overall, what, when you go back to the offensive line, does it make you nervous that, you know, you might have two starting tackles that are rookies. You got Eric Flowers who only has, you know, one good year at left guard because he was a disaster at left tackle and when he was in New York. You know, Karras, solid guy, solid vet, dependable. And then um, what are your thoughts on Jesse Davis too? I like Jesse Davis. I think he's, he's solid. Uh, I know I know his – Pro football focus grade was really bad last year, but I, I thought he played better than that. I thought down the stretch he was very solid. And, again, I like him better as a right guard than I do as a right tackle, but I think for the start uh, in 2020, if not the entire 2020 season, I think it might be the wise move to keep Jesse Davis at right tackle and have Robert Hunt start at least start at right guard. Uh, do the same thing with him that they, as they did with uh, Laramie Tunsil when he came out in 2016 and played as a rookie at guard and then move him to tackle. And then you may, you may find that Robert Hunt completely lights it up at right guard and you decide, maybe that's a spot. Uh, nothing wrong with having a Pro Bowl right guard. Uh, although I understand the need for a right tackle if Tua is going to be your long-term quarterback because that's his blind side. So anyway, long answer, long-winded answer to the question. Yes, I like Jesse Davis. He's a very solid guy. Um, based on last year and getting five wins with that roster, the expectations are pretty high this year. Um, pretty, <laughs> pretty high, especially with drafting two and stuff as well. Um, what would you, what would you say? Cause I've been on record. I think eight and eight, seven or nine to me, that's the goal because that shows an improvement. I don't care whether it's two or three wins that shows an improvement. Um, especially given the circumstances going on in the world right now. What do you say? Because there are people out there that are saying, no, I expect 10, 11 wins. You know, I expect to be fighting for one of those wild card spots that have been added. What, what would you say to fans that have expectations of 10-ish wins that wouldn't be happy or wouldn't be fine with seven or eight wins? 
Uh, yeah, I would say I would say be reasonable <laughs> would be the, would be the thing I would say, and I would say look at the offensive line. Mm-hmm. Does that does that screen playoff caliber right? Because right now, again, there's a lot of hope for the future because they invested in it. But is it realistic to think that it's going to be a really good unit from the start of the 2020 season? That's tough. Is it realistic to think the defense is going to go from being really porous as it was last year to being middle of the pack? Say. Uh, I think your your expectations to go seven and nine, eight and eight, and mind you, their schedule is not easy either. No, nope. because they got saddled with the NFC West, mm-hmm. which just happened to be the best division in the NFL last year, and which is not getting any weaker, by the way. Uh, in fact, I would tell you the Rams are the Rams right now are probably the worst team in that division because Arizona has made upgrades. Seattle is really good, and San Francisco is just loaded. Uh, so it's not going to be easy with that schedule. And I think it's also possible. It's not impossible that they could go five and eleven again and still be better and play better, but have the same result. Mm-hmm. So I, I think, I think, to start dreaming about ten and six, that is wildly optimistic. I would say. Yeah, but it's your- nice. It's nice to dream, though. Nothing wrong. With that. <laughs> um, one of the games I've circled on the calendar because we talked about the offensive line here is that game against San Francisco because. I believe we're going to see what these guys are made of against that front. Um, you know, I, I've also been on record. I, I think offensive line next to quarterback, some of the hardest positions to learn when you're translating to the next level. Do you think that's another reason that's going to play a factor into, hey, let's take our time with Tua. Let's see what we got with this offensive line first. Yeah, I mean, there's something to that. Uh, I think it's a, the it's the David Carr effect, where where he got beaten up big time as a rookie with Houston in 2002, and there are some will tell you he never recovered from it, and it was never the same quarterback. It became a guy with happy feet and could never deliver on the promise that he had shown coming out of college. Um, so that could be, certainly be something that factors into the equation as to exactly when to get to when to the starting lineup is what does the offensive line look like? You don't want to get him. Don't want him getting beaten up up there, A, for his psyche, and B, because let's face it, uh, durability is a concern with the guy. Mm-hmm. So the, the getting him exposed to additional hits that maybe he shouldn't be exposed to is not exactly a great way of doing business. Hmm. Okay. So, I mean, we pretty much covered everything. It's been fantastic. I got just two personal questions for you related to the Dolphins. My first one is next to Dan Marino – because, I mean, that's everyone's probably. Maybe it's not yours, though. Who is your favorite Dolphin of all time that you watched? Um, 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 as, a, as a player to watch. Yeah. Oh, Ricky Williams, I would say. He, like, he's the, is, the way he ran, it was like it was a clinic for running backs. We talk about Kalen Balaj not having, like, the intangibles to play the running back position. Like Ricky, it's almost he would see the hole a second before it was created. It was amazing to watch. Okay, based off that, I'll ask this question as well. Do you think if we would have had an upgrade over Jay Fiedler, we could have competed for a Super Bowl? That's <laughs> good question, eh? No, it's a good question, and it's certainly fair to suggest. I, I'll, I'll tell you this. the the most frustrating season of all of those since Marino retired was two, and I don't know if you recall it very well. Is two thousand two, the Dolphins started off, I believe it was five and one. Jay Feeler was playing excellent at quarterback. Got hurt, right? And then, he, then he broke his thumb or, her, or sprained his thumb in a Sunday night win at Denver, where there were three fifty yard field goals in the last minute, and then it sent the season going spiraling downward. They when they got to five and four, they and they wound up losing the last two games of the season to finish nine and seven, not make the playoffs. And that team, that's that's the first year Ricky was on the team, rushed for eighteen hundred fifty three yards, set a, a dolphin record that still stands, still stands, may never get broken. And that was a good shot. But yeah, they, yeah, they they missed the boat because the the sad part is that. After Jimmy Johnson left and his – I did a story on his legacy a little while back about how he's really taken some unfair shots about his time with the Dolphins. He made the playoffs three out of four years. He built a championship-caliber defense that he left. 
the one thing he didn't do well is he basically left the team in the hands of Dave Wanstead, who history will, will tell us was better suited to be a defensive coordinator than a head coach. And they kind of wasted a really, really, really good defense. I mean, Tim Bowens, Jason Taylor, Zach Thomas, Sam, Sam Madison, Patrick Sertain. Yeah, my, was Jeremiah Bell the safety on that team? Jeremiah Bell came later. later, Bell, later, later. later yeah. yeah. So I got to ask you this too, basically going off that, because it's one thing that's always bo- – doesn't it just bug you to the core as a Dolphin fan of how close that window was between Marino retiring and us acquiring Ricky Williams because the things Marino could have done – with that, with that, with that. No, 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 no. I don't see. I don't. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think you could have had a Dan Marino and a Ricky Williams at their peak together. Um. I mean, there. It's basically you. You kind of made the choice that when you had Dan Marino, your team was going to build around Dan Marino, and that's certainly understandable. But then you couldn't. You couldn't have it the other way either. Which, when even when Jimmy Johnson first arrived, and even with Dave Wanstead and beyond, they decided their team was going to be built on defense and the running game, which is why did Dan Marino took a back seat when Jimmy Johnson arrived, which didn't work out particularly well between those two. And there, those weren't Marino's best years. Not a not not a coincidence that the last time he made the Pro Bowl was 1995, which was Don Shula's last year. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I guess my last question for you is. We've had him on the show. He's an absolutely fantastic human being, Richmond Webb. Do you think, because I've said this, and I know everyone gets crazy over the Erlacher-Thomas comparison, I think Richmond Webb has a more rightful place in the Hall of Fame than Zach Thomas. Um, I'm not saying Zach Thomas doesn't deserve it. I just think he's the bigger atrocity. I mean, the NFL named him on the 1990 All-Decades team. Do you think Richmond Webb, should be in the Hall of Fame, and which one, if you had a ballot and you could only pick one of the two guys, which one would you be voting in? Uh, I like both guys as people, great guys, both great players. I'm going to have to disagree with you here. I, I would go Zach. Um, and I'll give you a couple of numbers here too. Jason Taylor, and I hope I'm, I remember them very well, actually, because I wrote about this not too long ago, that Jason Taylor, believe it was, Oh, I want to say six Pro Bowls and three All Pro selections, and Zach Thomas was seven Pro. No, Jason Taylor was five Pro Bowls, three All Pro selections. Zach Thomas was seven Pro Bowls and five All Pro selections. Mm-hmm. And that's not to say that that's everything. Uh, and then the number of plays that he made. And to me, if you think of those defenses of the two thousands for the Dolphins, late nineties, early two thousands. I uh, can we really say that it was totally Jason Taylor, or do we always put Jason? It was Jason and, and Zach. To me, well, I think it was. I think it's always it's Jason and Zach. Yeah, I think. Uh, no, I agree. You know, that secondary was pretty nice too. That old defense was yeah. was really good. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I think Zach Thomas is phenomenal. I mean, you know, one of the things that hurt more. I mean, I won't say hurt more, but to me, it hurt as much was. I know a lot of people didn't like seeing Jason Taylor in those Jets colors, but it was weird seeing Zach Thomas in those Dallas Cowboy colors. I mean, it was really, really weird. Um, but, uh, Alan, I mean, you know, you've given me an hour and 20 minutes of your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. I know the comment section, I mean, they're absolutely love it. I, nothing except great things being said about you right now. We've got about 90 people in the room live with us right now um, watching. Um, I mean, any final thoughts, Alan? Uh, I mean, the floor is yours. If you want to plug your Twitter, um, if you want to plug anything you're doing, I mean, the floor is yours, my friend. Oh, I would certainly hope that whoever's watching this goes to check out the, the all dolphins on the SI.com NFL network. The, uh, the URL is SI.com slash NFL slash dolphins. And I would also highly encourage you to comment on the stories. Give me your opinions. Give me your thoughts. If you think I'm crazy, you wouldn't be the first. Uh, And by all means, let let, let her rip. Awesome. You know what, Alan? I absolutely – I think you're one of the best minds out there following the team. You know, I said, you know, you, Barry Jackson, and Cameron Wolf are my go-to guys. I love everything you do. Um, I can't say anything else except – 
just please continue it, continue to give us this great content. Um, you've been fantastic to communicate with, um, both in the DMs and on, and on screen. And sir, I would love to have you on, um, on a different occasion. You've been absolutely fantastic. And I really do appreciate you taking the time out of your night um, to educate my subscribers and inform them a little bit with your knowledge. It's been absolutely fantastic. Oh, I would tell you, it was totally my pleasure, and I'd be happy to do it again. I appreciate you, Alan. Um, so uh, we'll be in contact. And again, I appreciate you for coming on tonight. And um, I hope you, you and your family are happy, healthy, and blessed during these crazy circumstances, my friend. Yeah, right back at you. Stay safe. All right, brother. Have a good night. You too. Guys, absolute, absolute fantastic human being. Even, I mean, absolute fantastic human being. Absolute fantastic beat writer. He gave you the plugs. SI.com slash NFL slash Dolphins. Go check his workout. And he's all over the place, always pushing his work. You can find him on Facebook, Twitter. He is worth it your follow he is worth your click i can't say it enough i mean it's so refreshing to have an objective opinion um a guy who just calls it like it is straight down the middle and i can't tell him how much i appreciate not only him coming on the show but the work he does because like i said he's one of the people i follow the closest absolutely fantastic um and guys we're not done i know em isn't around um but guess what I got, guys? We are going to continue the hunt for a rookie autographed Tua Tungvaluwa card. Um, and we're going to do that right now. I have sent Ian the link. I don't know if he'll be joining, guys. Um, you guys want me to drop the link. I'll drop it for a little bit. Uh, and you guys can come on. Um, we're not going to go for too much longer. Um, FYI, but I'll let you guys come on, give your thoughts on everything Alan just went over. Um, absolutely fantastic person. I just dropped the link. We'll talk a little bit. Um, but yeah, absolute fan. Look at Dolphin82. Just couldn't wait, eh? All right, give me a sec here. Yeah, I dropped the link inside the uh, inside. Um, Inside the comment section, guys, if you wanna, if you wanna join, um, we're just gonna go over these cards, talk a little football, um, stick to the interview and such. Um, going on, brother. What's going on, brother? Just here, man. Uh, I just want to thank, um, thank you for a great show, man. That's all, man. This is that was a good show. That was great a great show. show. That's um. From the time I've been on, I've uh, been listening to podcasts for a few months. That's one of the most objective interviews I've seen. Uh, yeah. He was, he wasn't being a homer. He was, he was stating facts, man. That's that's. He knows his Dolphins, man. He knows his Dolphins, with the exception of him saying the Buffalo Bills going to Super Bowl. I, I didn't agree with that, but hey, that's a whole nother show. We stick to the interview. Yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, I don't. I think. More so, he said he sees the potential of them going to the Super Bowl. And, yo, I think they're going to win the AFC East, man. I'll say that. Um, I agree with you on that. Definitely agree with you, you know, on that. They're, 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 I mean, you know, that defense is pretty stacked. Um, you know, that offense is pretty stacked. Uh, you know, if Allen takes a leap in his accuracy, then it's going to be real trouble for everyone involved. Um, oh, yeah. Damien, what's good, homie? What's up? What's up, homie? Hey, what up, Damien? Hey, what's up with you, homie? All good, Damien. All How good. you doing tonight? How you doing tonight, brother? Oh, good, man. Watching a little NBA, man. I came in late on the um podcast, man, so I really didn't get to hear what everything was about going on. I had to do a little grocery shopping. <laughs> oh, it's all good, man. Yeah. I mean, hey, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna say go back and watch it because I'll take the view. So yeah. hey, <laughs> I'm, gonna tell, I'm gonna tell you to go back and watch it, bro. Listen all here, good. man. Oh yeah. All good. All, All the good, ones yo. I used to miss when I was at work, I would go back and watch it anyway. I would always hit reason up on Twitter. It was like, I'm going to go back and watch it when I can't get off of work. All you know, good. Always going to give the support. So, um, yeah. Actually, you know what? Before I get into the cards, I got a few things. Let's go over, okay? Mm -hmm. um, 
because I went and did some research, and I'm going to expand on a point I was making a few shows ago. And I'll put these up, and I'll let you guys talk about it. Um, just let me roll through each one of my points and just give me a second to set them up here because I wasn't planning to actually do this tonight, but I'll rock it. So we'll just go over quickly. We're not going to address anyone specifically by name, and I think you guys both know what I mean by that. We're going to talk about Josh Rosen for a second here. Oh, okay. God. And it's going to be real quick. Um, it's going to – we'll go over a few things because I feel a little digging because I got, you know – I know Dolphin might have saw one of the things that I posted. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to – I guess I'll post them right now, and then we'll do a little bit of a deep dive, and we'll get your guys' opinion on it. Now, if you remember, um, one of the things I said, guys, on the last stream that got a lot of people bent out of shape um, was I compared Josh Rosen – to John Beck, correct? Correct. Yeah, and I second that on that on that stream when I called that out also. So let me show. I don't know if you saw this, Dame. I got Rhino here too. What up, Rhino? Know. Rhino, what up, bro? And I got Havoc. What's so up, Havoc? Havoc? I don't know if you guys saw this, Things but I'm going to go through. Give me a few seconds. I'm going to go through a few images here, explanation, and then I'll let you guys, you know, say whatever you want to say. First thing I'm going to bring up. So I took John Beck's 2007 season and I looked into it. God, that was the worst. And I took Josh Rosen's 2019 season. So Josh Rosen in 2019 was 0 and 3 as a starter. He's played six total games. He was 58 of 109 for 53.2 completion percentage, 50, 567 yards, one touchdown, five interceptions. That means he, Holy threw, a crap. he threw a touchdown on 0.9% of his throws and an interception on 4.6% of his throws. John Beck, in 2007, he was 0 and 4 as a starter. He played five games, and this is where it gets eerie. 60 of 107 for a 56.1 completion percentage, 559 yards, one touchdown, and three interceptions. He also threw a touchdown on 0.9% of his throws and an interception on 2.8% of his throws. Yep. Man, that's bad company to be in. When you're in the same company as, as a car salesman, that's ugly. I mean, you want to throw something crazier when John Beck actually played. And, and guys, I saw someone when I posted this in the community were like, oh, why aren't you comparing the, their, their career stats? Apple, Apple. I ain't comparing careers here. <laughs> I'm comparing John Beck's first year as a Dolphin to Josh Rosen's first year as a Dolphin. Because a lot of people, me and EM have talked about John Beck in private. A lot of people, I imagine, in our fan base right now don't remember – John Beck coming out of BYU. BYU, I do. Yeah, I was gambling sports. I'm, I'm not saying you guys don't. I'm saying a lot of people don't. <laughs> people probably don't remember that a lot of our fan base was excited about John <laughs> Beck because we got him at the end of the second. If you, right. watched, if you watched this film at BYU, it wasn't all that bad. No, I didn't. I didn't come across a lot of people that were excited about John Beck, and I was living in Miami at the time. Yeah, a lot. Well, I mean, at least a lot of people in the draft selection is make no one knocked it. Why? Because we spent a late second round pick on him. That was Cam Cameron's um um first oh and only draft. That was the tenth year, right? That was that was Cam Cameron's first and only draft, right? Cam yeah, you know, Beck only spent uh, oh, one year in Miami. Yeah, oh, yeah because he didn't actually start a game. He didn't Sorry. start a game until 2010. <laughs> after this, after his 2007 man. season. God, Washington. that was some tough years. That was man. that was Cam Cameron and Rick Spielman, right? Yes, it was. Oh, my God. I think the that's one of, one of the worst years we ever had. The dynamic duo. Which I give credit. Spielman is doing way better in Minnesota, I guess. you know. Just, yeah. Can't. I okay, guess he so took his lumps here. Let, let me yeah, keep he it, yeah, yeah. He let keep it rolling here, like here. everybody. Let me keep it yeah. rolling here. So the one thing we keep hearing is, well, his offensive line. His offensive line in Arizona. That's why he was so bad. So I did some more. Deep diving and digging. Right. And this is what I found. And again, I'm rounding down, okay? 
So I'm actually doing him a freaking favor. All right. So the Arizona 2018 offensive line, RJ Humphreys didn't get injured until week 10. He just signed a huge extension. Mason Cole, their starting center, played all 16 games. Justin Pug didn't get hurt until week 10, and he's actually a really good player. Mikey Apati, who's now with Seattle, very good guard, started oh. 10 games, didn't get hurt till week 13. Andre Smith was the other starting tackle, and he got released after week 12. So let's round down to week 10 because he lost Justin Pug and RJ Humphreys. So Josh Rosen up until week 10 as a starter with that protection was 112 for 201 for 55.7 completion percentage, six touchdowns, seven interceptions, 1,244 yards. Again, he started, I believe, six games over this period, and he went he went uh, two and four over that period. So two and four as a starter, 6.19 yards per attempt, four fumbles, two fumbles lost. Rosen threw a touchdown on 2.9% of his throws and an interception on 3.5% of his throws with all of his starters there. So he still didn't crack 60%. Okay. If you go to 12, well, people are going to say, well, he threw for 1,244 yards. Okay. But he started six games. So what, he's getting just over 200 yards a game. What is that? What are you doing with that? Well, you're not gonna, what are you going to do with that? You can do nothing with that. And it's not like it was a heavy run-based offense either where, you know, you can give the excuse that, okay, we run the ball 60% of the time. I, yeah, haven't, right? looked into, even I haven't looked into David Johnson's numbers in that year, but I'm pretty sure got hurt that year, David Johnson. Yeah, he always gets hurt. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. I, I, th I think I think we're at a point where it's, it's about time to uh, – I'm not done, bro. I'm not done. It gets okay. worse. So I got this up. <laughs> no, it does get worse because I, I'm bringing all this up, okay, but people are okay. – <laughs> So if you guys remember, one of the images I shared, okay, when we did that whole Chan Gailey show, all right, um, when we had a female screaming and yelling over everyone and trying to talk over everyone, I showed this image. And what was being screamed? What was the female voice we heard in the background? Oh, he won that game. He won that game. He Aaron won Rogers that game. Hold on a sec. No, hold on a sec. He won that game? Or the Arizona Cardinals? won that game oh reason what do you mean of course the arizona cardinals won it josh rosen was on the team no 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 the error because i just showed you and i'll show you it again that should have been an interception mm -hmm. it would have been in the red zone okay so let's go to that game december 2nd 2018 arizona won by three josh rosen 11 for 26 for 42.3 completion percentage, 149 yards, zero touchdowns, zero interceptions, a 61.2 quarterback rating, 5.73 yards per attempt, dink and dunk all day, and one fumble. And the image that I just showed you, he should have had an interception in his own red zone that would have potentially set Green Bay up to win that game. They so you look at this up. stat line, you look at this stat line, you look at the one play I just showed you when it was a pressure situation. Did Josh Rosen win that game or did the Arizona Cardinals win that game? The defense won that game. They won in spite of poor quarterback play. play. You're really going to try and argue that clip that I showed with, oh, he won the game when the man had a 42.3 completion percentage and only threw for 149 yards as a start? What kind of world are we living in? <laughs> are we that desperate for quarterback play that we're willing to take terrible quarterback play and try to pass it off as something more than mediocre? You know, I mean, and, I, and I'm gonna I'm gonna lay this out too. And I'm gonna lay this out for everyone to hear right now. If you're gonna use clips from our show, you best be prepared for the copyright claims that are about to follow those clips being used. And I ain't going to say any more than that. Enough said. If you don't have my permission to use our clips, that's a copyright violation. And I don't want you to think for one second that good old reason ain't going to go through a copyright claim. <laughs> because if you've done it, believe me here and now, the process has already started. And that's all mm. I'm going to say in regards to that. So now that I've showed you, hold on, and let's, let's just remind people of 
what Josh Rosen did in a 17 to 7, 17 to 17 game with that stat line and the game on the line. One more time for the people. You can even see the score 17 to 17, four minutes left from his own 10. From so, his own 10. No, yeah. the Arizona Cardinals won that game. Josh Rosen didn't win that game. And anyone trying to tell you different is not only a fool, but they're trying to make a fool out of you. Agreed. Yeah, I mean, I think we you know we're at a point right now where, you know, we, we, we have the stats in front of us. We've had several qualified people give their opinions on it. I, I mean, think you know, what, did, I, what, did, I, what did Alan Pupar just say about Josh Rosen? But I will – what did Brian Cat? What did Brian Cat say? Brian Cat said, "I get the offensive line, but mm -hmm. he's still shown us nothing. Where if he's going to have a good offensive line, he's going to produce." I will. I will just say though, uh, at a certain point, as fans that are informed about the team and the players on the team, uh, we got to stop taking the bait because you know the people out th out here talking about you know he should be getting a chance to start, you know. They're they're not going to go away, and at a certain point. Oh, they're going to go you know, away when he's gone. At a, at a certain point, we, we. I'm not sure. At a, at a certain point, we need to understand that you know, he is who he is. We know who he is. We've looked through the the numbers. We've seen the video. We've talked about it endlessly. He is who he is. So I think just as informed fans, we need to shut the door on this because, you know, as much as we want to push back on the haters. We're starting to sound like haters now. And I understand that we got the facts, but at a certain point, we know we, we all know what the vibes are. We know who the future is. We know who the present is. So, you know, for me, you know, I've I've given my opinion on him several times. You all know the vibes. I'm not out here advocating for him or trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. But at a certain point, you know, we just need to shut the door on it because none of us up here honestly believe he has a chance to be the future starting quarterback for this team. Honestly, no one well, up here gonna, really believes I'm gonna tell you this havoc. Shot. I'm going to tell you this, Havoc. These people better be prepared to die on that hill because not only am I going to leave them laying on that hill with swords riddled through their body like they just lost a battle in seven deadly sins, I'm going to plant my flag in their corpse on that hill, and it's going to have <laughs> to his face right on it. And I'm going to... These people that are creating this divide, wanting to create these issues over Josh Rosen, y'all better be ready for it when he ain't on this roster anymore because all your credibility, it's gone. It's already gone. But what's going to be six feet under the ground when this guy is moved on from? And I just want people to realize that they better be ready to die on that hill because we're going to make a freaking show of it. Because when that man gets moved on from, you can guarantee we're going to throw a barbecue on this channel. EM's going to go barbecue some lobster tails up live. We're going <laughs> to invite a bunch of you guys on. I'm going to go to a party store. I'll get some streamers and some hats. And we're going to really let these people know that wanted to create divides. I wanted to create tension. I wanted to create problems. Enjoy that hill, my friend, because there ain't no bigger one to die on right now. And it's actually reason. ridiculous. Hey, reason to change the subject. Uh, are y'all going to throw a barbecue when Holland is serving our uh, wings at Wingstop, too? What are you talking about, man? Holland's is going to be serving at the barbecue. Oh, you heard he needs a job. Not Holland's going to be flipping <laughs> the meat, bro. Yeah, bro. He's going to be on the grill. He's, I mean, you know, Heb, Jeb. Holland's you know, on the grill. You're going to have, uh, you know, Rosen as, as, as the assistant manager. You got John Beck as the regional manager. You got all the washed up former. You got Kalen Balaj working the cashier. <laughs> you know, we got all the washed up dolphins. They're going to be at the barbecue. But, you know, at a certain point, it's we, 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 we got to shut the door. We got to shut the door as, as, as knowledgeable fans, as fans that have that have the privilege of, of, of seeing him play and knowing honestly what he projects to be we gotta shut the door on it because at, i understand that you know what we're saying may be factual but at a certain point you know it sounds like it sounds like you're beating a dead horse and i just don't want to i just don't want to fall into that trap where we just you know we we just we just beating the dead horse just Bro, to beat what, is it. what is there left to say i just laid it out for everyone i literally showed people that you could make his a 29 comparison to john beck
I mean, what else more is there really to say? Yeah. So, I mean, that's it for me on Josh Rosen. I've said all I got to say on that guy. And and no, no, it's, it's, it's another reason. Um, reason. Um, I know a lot of comments down here saying reason keeps talking about the same thing. I, the, the point is the reason why he's talking about the same thing because after he posted a Don Beck and um, Rosen 2019 stats, somebody made a comment like, why didn't you just post the entire stats? Career. Yeah, his career. Career off his 2018. So he had to prove the point that no matter okay. what stats I proved, I'm just letting you know the dude still suck. That's the whole more of the story tonight, guys. Oh, that, I, mean, I just want to clear that up. Okay. I, mean, I, was in, I, was in, I was in class. I didn't really check out too much what was going on today. But uh, yeah. I well, someone, someone was just like, oh, why didn't you post there? I didn't respond to the person, but they're like, why didn't you post his whole career stats? And I'm thinking to myself, like, is reading comprehension really that big of a lost intangible that we can't put <laughs> together here? Like, clearly, I'm just making a 2019 to a 2007 comparison. That's all it is. First year to first year. I mean, you don't got to be Sherlock Holmes to put that one together. And if you do, oh, boy, you need to wor be worried less about watching videos about dolphins, and you need to be watching some videos about educating yourself. So, Although so, I, do remember, I do remember John Beck was – it was a very rough time because I don't, I don't, I don't know what, 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 who was watching. Enough, that game on but. enough of John Beck. Have <laughs> y'all seen that tour documentary trailer? Yeah, I'm gonna play. No, it. I haven't seen I'm it. Gonna, I'm gonna Man. play it. And hey, hey, reason you need to play that. Yeah, I have it queued up. Let me just get. Through yeah. This first. If y'all don't get goosebumps off of this, man, I don't know. Y'all not a Dolphins fan, straight up. Yeah, I mean, okay. you know. It's it's at a, at a certain point, you know. I understand the Patriots hold the dynasty crown until mm -hmm. someone takes off their head. That's how that's that that's how champions work. You you want to be the champion, you got to take the crown off their head. We talking about we talking about having we took the head off last year. You forgot bro, the game, bro. You 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 come on, come on, man. You know you got to confirm the kill. Come oh, on, we man. gonna confirm it game one, Playboy. We gonna come confirm on. it game one. You know, you know, you, know you got to confirm the kill. You can't, you know, when when you, you just because you put the giant down, you got you got to make sure he stays down. Right. And, and, we we gonna put you know, a dagger in a hard game one. I you guarantee know, you that. And it's like so. you know, we we building a we building our new dynasty right now, and soon yeah. we gonna be in that position where they say, "Man, I'm tired of this two a guy coming around to Buffalo what? and giving us a business. I'm tired of two coming around to Foxborough." And give us business. Have it. Speaking of dynasty, mm. uh, some Patriots uh, kind of sore last night claimed that they that. have another dynasty building. Man, I lost it. I almost, I, dude, I almost turned the damn show off, man. I'm like, I can't listen to this crap. Somebody claimed Cam Newton is the next dynasty. And yeah, he tell said, me that. Tell me that. He said two, three Super Bowls. He Not one. What? He was like LeBron. Maybe Only one. Only three? Only maybe three? two. Maybe three. Yeah, oh I mean, yeah, yeah and that's facts. You can go uh, listen to the show. That's facts. Apparently, is... apparently, nothing's changed in New England. It's not like, not like nobody, nobody has walked out the door that was possibly holding the key to all the rings <laughs> they got. Nah, it's Cam got to no... take over where Tom Brady left off. Yes, please, where he left off. Calm down. And now, if the Patriots had the type of offensive line they had five years ago, if they had speedy receivers like Brandon Cooks that can help Cam Newton out with that strong mm -hmm. arm that he has for a deep threat, and they had the defensive starters that they had last year, then I would say, yeah, you would probably see close to 2015 Cam or 2018 Cam before he got hurt. Yeah. But the, they have no receivers that can create any type of separation. They don't mm -hmm. have a solid tight end that Cam depends on. Greg Olsen. Tom Brady couldn't do nothing with like, those receivers. Yeah, like hey, I, hey, I, don't, I don't see point, how. Point of havoc. I point havoc. I just don't see Tom Brady have the capability mentally and the smarts to even handle that offense. And as he can, can. Belichick said a few days ago, he's not changing his offense for to, um Cam. He's not I mean, going to do it. Be honest with you, I think he will. Oh, they're going to go back to – they're going to go to that, that Denver game. offense that they ran with Tebow. They're going yeah, to be he, similar. You, you can't run that. Similar. You can't run they that can't same, run offense, the same with offense with Cam Newton. No, they, they're gonna, they have to change the offense for him. They, they don't have a choice. Because McDaniels is he, – he's familiar with running a similar type of offense like that yeah. around a quarterback Listen, with that type of skill set. Josh McDaniels knows what to do with uh, – Yo, I just got to say, Henry Ruggs is absolutely freaking ripped. Okay? Look at that. Look at that. It's Photoshop. Yeah. 
I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. That's that's there a filter. That's go. a filter. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I mean, we we know Josh McDaniels knows how to work with a quarterback of diminishing arm talent. He Let me just think like up. that. <laughs> yeah, he like drafted he, him. He drank he drank the juice on Tebow, and he 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 rode that as far as he could. And but you know, ultimately, you know, it's it's like I say, I say this all the time. And I don't mean this applies to Cam Newton. Obviously, he's a former league MVP. But don't get obsessed with these workout videos. Don't get obsessed oh, no. with these look the part all stars. I mean, if 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 workout videos translated to the field, Jakeem Grant would be an all pro. Yep. Exactly. So at a certain point, we just gotta just trust the film of him against other NFL quality players. Don't trust the film of him in his in his shorts with no shirt on, uh, throwing the ball around to community college wide receivers because you, you, you're, you're, you're buying that fool's gold. And at a certain point, I mean, in my estimation, I think Cam at some point he's going to get hurt at some point during the season. He has not been See, healthy. My, my he hasn't been healthy is, the past three seasons. Yeah, but he's, he's bulked up too much for my taste. Um, like, you got to be, you know, I mean, look at the size of him right now. There's no way. He's as fast as he was in 2015 at that size. But he can't put um, his he can't put his shoulder down and run into guys because he, he he's taken too many hits, like the accumulation me, of hits over his career. It's too much at this point. Just give me a sec. I want to go over the autographs I got here. Yeah. So Lucky Jackson, wide receiver, DJ Dallas, running back out of Miami, Ray Wilborn, linebacker, and Carter Coughlin. So Four autos. No yeah. one worth a damn. <laughs> That's what I was about to say, who are they? But well, DJ Dallas. Um, DJ Dallas is I still actually wanted the Dolphins to draft roster. him. Yeah. In the late rounds. We were, we were panicking about a running back before we got Barreda. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, wanted Joshua, was... I wanted Joshua Kelly from UCLA. I wanted the kid from um, Boston College. So none, none of you guys Kelly. think so none of you guys think that Stidham is gonna start the beginning of the season. Uh, am I the only one? I mean, I'm not saying there's never a possibility that Stidham will, but right now, who the hell knows? I mean, I want Stidham I to start. I, 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 I here's a thing. Million year contract. <laughs> here's the thing. Starting. I think the, the rest of the AFC East would love for Jared Stidham to start for the Patriots. I don't, I don't think he's going to be that bad. Coordinators. I don't think I Stidham is going to be that start. bad. I don't think he's going to be that bad. I don't think he's going to be that good either. And then no, all well, we're talking about good being Brady. You're talking about being. Uh, I'm, talking, I'm talking about being like, like a meddling, you know, close to two to one interception to touchdown ratio. Wasn't that at Have Auburn it. or Texas A&M? He wasn't that. He was. Not Did you that. just stated that you think we rather have Stidham start than Cam? Yes. Who me? Yeah, or, I would. I, I mean, mean, yes. I, would. I don't know, man. Yeah, I don't Give know. Give me Stidham's Stidham. Guy. It's not Brady. I don't care. Against Flores, yeah, he, yeah. first game of the season, all the pressure's on Stidham to replace Brady. Give me Stidham against Flores. Yeah. Give me Stidham. Mm. Especially yeah, when it could that, be man. a possibility we might start Tua to make it more of a you know what? easier. If, Give if, me Stidham. If, if Cam don't start, it's going to be an issue. Yeah. It's going to be an issue. Yep, it's <laughs> turmoil. That's what we want. We want disaster. And then, the and team then, then, then you know what? You know what? If, if Cam don't start, just watch them. Press conferences come up. Oh, yeah. His hat, mm. his, his hats are going to get bigger and bigger. Bigger and bigger. <laughs> bigger and bigger. <laughs> we want that. We want that. <laughs> because you know, you know, you know, Cam's in a good mood when the hats are small. When the yeah. when he comes out with the church lady hats, you know, Cam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. But it, it's, it's, it runs deeper than us just dominating them the first game of the season in Foxborough. We have. I want to ask y'all a question. Hmm. What are y'all odds on us winning the division? On a scale of one to ten, I mean, Bob, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna take a, a, a three or a four. Three or four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Four. yeah slim, man, slim. I'm yeah. not, I'm not that whole, I'm not that Dude, homer type of sense. guy, man. Let me tell you why. I'm, I'm not scared. that homer type of guy. We are, we are at Buffalo, where oh, Buffalo was at two years ago. Think about it. Mm-hmm. Brand new they went quarterback. To the playoffs. They, they, they were on, between on. years. Hold on, hold on. Listen to me. We're at Buffalo, Buffalo two years ago. Brand new quarterback, building the defense, haven't proven yet. The following year, they start showing signs. 
than that next year they finally made it to the playoffs. That's where we at right now. Yeah, we look good on paper, but it hasn't come on paper on the field yet. Yes. I don't think I don't think we are there yet to win the AFC division. Yeah, I know you listen to all these homer tubers and saying that yeah, we're going 11, 12, no. 13, and freaking two. It's, we're not going there yet. It's not that. My, my, a good season for me this year is an eight and eight season. I agree. That's a good season. I got still when I said that's that. That's a win in the division. Dude, you can go I, 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 I think Buffalo's going to win the division. No, I don't, I I don't know if that'll win the division. Back. But that'll be a great back, season. Go back I to don't trust started. Josh Allen. I think that they could take a step back. I do not yes, trust Josh they Allen. Could. At all. They could. I feel you. I feel they you. Could. Nobody, nobody just um trust Josh Allen. Anybody on this panel in the, um yeah. the comment section will tell you they don't, just, don't trust, trust Josh, Josh Allen. Allen. They just call him because they don't have any other better options. Because if they we have, use, they have a great defense, guys. Let's just get do. that up. Yes, they, they do. do. They have a great defense. And he offense. has weapons on that offense. Man, they drag hey, you, you guys are really – see, here's my thing with Dolphin fans. Dolphin fans are really shortchanging how good that run game is going to be this year. Um, and for a team like us who's had problems stopping the run, yeah, a one-two punch, and we're going to have a lot of rookies and new names, new faces across that front seven. It takes time. You know, Zach Thomas and Devin Singletary – you know, you could make the argument. I get. I know Zach Thomas is, but I will say this: by the end of the season, they're probably going to be the best one-two punch in the AFC East. I don't have a doubt. I don't have a doubt about that. Um, okay. Devin Buffalo Sing got the pieces, Devin, man. Devin Singletary, look, Devin Singletary looked very, very special at mm -hmm. times yep. last yep. year. I've gone over this multiple times. Why did they get Stephon Diggs? One of the main reasons they got Stephon Diggs was his catch ball. Was his catch Stretch radius? Field. No, his what? catch radius. His catch radius. His catch radius will will mask accuracy deficiencies from Josh Allen. It's true. Okay. Stefan Diggs has one of the bigger catch radiuses in the NFL for his size. That's a huge, huge asset. And you know, like Allen pointed out, John Brown, who ate us alive, is now designated to the number two guy. Ate us. Mm -hmm. And people keep forgetting on uh, Dawson Knox. They're tight. But, but look at our secondary now. Yeah, but that's, that's all yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. But but, Xavier's on the pup. Yeah, yeah for the, he's on the COVID list. He's on he's the, on the COVID, COVID list. He's on the COVID list. He's on both. He's on both. And you got, and you got no, one last on COVID list. No, he's on the COVID list and he's on the pup. pup. Physically unable to perform. Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah, that, yeah. That, leaves, that leaves you one lockdown cornerback, right? One. Brown burnt us last year. Who's going to cover Brown? Because we all know we're going to put Byron Jones and um, you got to need him or need him. Need him to the hell. Take that I mean, all the choice. You're going to have to hope yeah. he takes a step. And two, Alan, Alan make a good point on um the Reason Show earlier. Hmm? What the hell is freaking Allen just developing in his mechanics this year? Oh, that's that that's a big if. No, shit right there. No, that's not gonna you, happen. You, you never if you're know. not accurate, if you, you can't Listen. develop accuracy. I mean, it's, no, you got but it you, or you can don't. get better at it though. You're no. not going to become no. great, a great accurate. No. The moment, the moment a quarterback that does better with his mechanics, the moment he's under pressure and has to rush yeah, and make quick decisions, back it's, to his gone. Old ways. it's gone. It's yeah. gone. That's why I say we have a happens. shot because of Josh Allen. He will lose you games. Yeah. That's why they won so many close games because yeah, the thing he is, couldn't separate himself. Josh Allen looks like a Josh Allen looks like a Pro Bowler. Every time he plays us, so, though. But yeah, because yeah. That, us, yeah. Yeah, just and, us. And the, and the thing is, yo, uh, mechanics can improve your accuracy and it can even improve um, the distance you put on a football if you have flawless mechanics. But that's all it that's is. The problem, the problem that happens is, and I, I talked about this with Justin Herbert, because his mechanics are absolutely terrible at times. Because what you see, it's kind of what Rhino said, but it's a little deeper. When you see the when the pressure starts coming and the pocket collapses, and they get forced to make quick reads, they go back to their bad habits. What you have to do is coach habits. See, when you got a guy who's got bad mechanics, not only do you got to coach him to improve those mechanics, but not a lot of people talk about the fact you also got to coach the habits out of because he's just going to naturally revert to what he feels comfortable doing when he's in a moment of pressure. And that's where the bad mechanics mm -hmm. can come into play. And this is what happened with um, – and I, I, I like that they're, you know, specifically the Chargers are taking their time with Justin Herbert and not throwing him to the wolves because the problem was the same with Tannehill as it is with Josh Allen. 
Josh at well, not the team situation, but what they asked of him. Josh Allen came in a situation where they had the defense. They started putting pieces around him, and they were like, hey, we can start making noise as soon as you um, join the roster. So mm-hmm. what they asked him to do was the same of what we asked Ryan Tannehill to do for his first three, four years is basically be a one, two read quarterback. After you come off that initial read or that second read, you got to make something happen with your legs. And that's why you see Josh Allen. You rarely see Josh Allen get to his third, fourth progression, third, fourth, come back to his first. You never see that. And that's take because off. they've asked them. They basically situated that offense where, you know, if you don't like what you see after that second read, get out of there and make something happen with your pocket out of the pocket. That's basically in a nutshell what they asked Josh Allen to do. Um, and that's what we asked Ryan Tannehill to do for his first couple of years, if you guys remember correctly. So mm. that's what – here's the thing. But now with the circumstances, you know, this is another year where – I mean, let's be honest with ourselves. They were really smart. He knows the offense. He doesn't need the preseason uh, – the preseason game snaps anyways. So mm-hmm. if I'm the, if I'm McDermott and company who just signed that massive six-year – Yeah, snap, okay, signed that. Today. What I would be doing – is I would be focusing, Josh, okay, you'll take snaps with the first stringers, et cetera, et cetera. But, man, I am spending money on bringing in a quarterback coach like that can spe- – not a quarterback coach for my team, but a specific quarterback coach like we did with Josh Rosen last year that just works with him. Just work with him preseason, throughout the season. Just work on him getting his the fundamentals of mechanics – Better, crisper, and get those start become his habits. That's what I would. That's the smart play. I mean, I talk about this all the time. Why did Drew Brees get better after the injury? He lost zip on his arm, but it's because he went to Tom House, and Tom House worked on his mechanics. Now he has the same throwing motion as Greg Maddox, a Hall of Fame pitcher from the Atlanta Braves. Then what happened? Tom Brady went there too, because the thing that I tell all these people, Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, two perfect examples. Josh Herbert more because he is more athletic and he does have more yardage. Like Justin Herbert's never going to be gain 250, 300 yards in the NFL in a season. He's not Josh Allen. I don't know where people get that. He only had like 75, 80 yards this year. So um, the problem is, is, you know, same with Vic. What do you see when Vic went to Philly? Andy Reid and company started working on his mechanics and they made him a pocket quarterback because as you get into the 30s and above, you can't your mechanics are what you're going to have to rely on to see the NFL in your mid to late thirties. You Just can't like a pitcher. Yeah, exactly. You can't like rely a- that cannon that, you know, all gunslingers as they get above 35, you start to see their arm die out by mm. week 13, week 14, week 15. It comes down to mechanics. That's why Drew Brees, he's in an offense that manufactures space for his receivers. And it just, relies on his accuracy and ball placement that's all so all he needs for that for accuracy and ball placement is flawless mechanics that's all he needs to focus on he doesn't need to work us on pumping iron or all this stuff that cam newton's out here doing because mechanics mechanics are gonna get you farther and keep you around longer in the nfl especially the longer aspect than just having a cannon that's question though reason yeah. Question. And all that being said, if you may have poor decision making as a quarterback, does it really matter? Yes, it does. Of course. So with him having a poor decision making that he is displayed in games, especially big games, even with him having these mechanics, you know, fixing his mechanics, if he's making terrible reads, <laughs> ill-advised throws, yeah, and all, like being reckless with the football, does it matter? Um. See, here's the difference with a guy like Herbert and Allen and the rest of the guys. Like, I'll compare them to Rosen. Okay. Uh, one of the reasons why Rosen gets intercepted a lot is he makes the wrong read or his read is late. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked about me and Allen talked about he's not a very good processor, right? The thing, the benefit about having a cannon is if you make a read that's slightly late, that arm can save you, right? See, and, and that's what, but then that can also be a downfall because then you get into a problem where, oh, you know, I've made late raids before and got the ball there before the defender did. I can make it there again. 
Brett Favre. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, the next thing you know, you're mm-hmm. and then the next thing you know, you're picked off because it's a higher caliber receiver. I mean, corner that's better at reading and reacting than the guy you just fitted in on. So that's the problem. It becomes a thing that people. It becomes almost the problem with a with a, a cannon is sometimes the guys can become way too dependent on it when it comes to processing and late reads, and that's when you can get interceptions and bad decisions. Hmm. I mean, if you even if you look at a guy like Mahomes, who doesn't always have flawless flawless mechanics, but he can get that ball off with a flick of the wrist. It don't matter. Like there isn't a coach in the world that would say, like roll out to the right and throw a sidearm ball to the opposite side of the field and not looking. But yeah, but when Mahomes does it, <laughs> everyone oh everyone gets out of their seat and gives them a standing ovation. But anybody else, but when Nathan Peterman does it, he almost threw himself out the league. Yeah, but- having one of the absolute worst halves of football i've ever seen in my entire life nathan peterman buffalo oh, Bills, it look it up. one of the worst i've ever seen in my entire life so a lot of it is contextual if, if you got tyreek hill and nicole hardman and uh and sammy watkins and yeah here doing uh you know cross field throws on your back foot with a with a sidewinder throw and it hits everybody loves it but if you josh allen with the history of poor decision making a guy who is more veered as a as a running quarterback than anything else and you out here trying to trying to freestyle it they're going to kill you so he's got he's got to make better decision making and the best thing for him is when the buffalo staff took the decision making out of his hands and they said one read two read take off you ain't even got to go any further than that in my opinion yeah i mean that's been the one, two read thing has been basically the MO since he came in the league form. Um, mm-hmm. And that's also just because, again, they were in a position where they thought they could make noise. So they didn't want to sit him for a year, groom him, and get him ready to basically, mm-hmm. you know, just throw him out there, throw him to the wolves or whatever. Um, and his athleticism has saved him a lot. Um, cool. So uh, I'm going to get out of here, guys. So any last thoughts? Um, you guys are willing to stick around once i go off here but um any last thoughts no we'll good shot, bro. And, off and we'll move down I mean, right, spins good. up you know that's it yeah good show man fins up yeah good job on the, on the catch dude. Good, good job, job. On the catch thanks man oh yeah um, hell of an article too man that was a hell of an article yeah, oh yeah good. oh you check you people yeah. Appreciate, yeah, it. Yeah, the article. appreciate it i'll share that link um in the community tab tomorrow guys but yeah, I dropped my first article with Dolphins Brawl, and I announced that um, I'll be doing a podcast with Niners Wire Sam, and as well as Pat, Pat Trena. Um, and yeah, we'll be having that starting either next week or the week after. That'll actually be on Tuesday nights, and I'll be running for a little bit over an hour, and it'll be over on the Brawl Network. So uh, we'll be kicking that off next week. And then yeah, I'm going to keep contributing. I got a couple ideas for my next articles, but I'll drop it because guys, I think, uh, and my graphic guy, I don't know if you guys noticed that whole fantastic four logo thing image that I had made up. My graphic guy did that too. So, um, yeah, I I loved it. So yeah, I'll post that link. Maybe I'll put it down underneath here, but I'll post in the community tab tomorrow for any of you guys who want to, um, read it. Um, Havoc Rhino, any, any last thoughts? Phew. I mean, it fins up. That's all I got to say, you know, all day, every day. Nope. Be good. Uh, and uh, I think Fitzpatrick looks uh, much more in shape this year. Well, what do you guys think real quick? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I, agree. I think he's motivated. I, I think actually, he's yeah. competition. I'll, 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 you know, we'll quickly, we'll go through actually before we get out of here, guys. For all of you who haven't seen the Tua Tungvaloa um, video trailer, um, I'll play that first for you. Um We'll go. Actually, let's go through a couple of things. We'll go through a bunch. Um, first things first. My boy out here throwing Ooh. dimes to Jakeem on a slant. Look at the zip. Looking, look, look, looking, looking like Tua versus uh throwing to Waddle. Mm. Baby, that's my you. hope. That's my hope next year. I want to get that Waddle. Look at that, baby. Yeah, I'll take Jalen Waddle for all day. Um, here's 22 seconds or 22 uh, seconds for y'all to enjoy of, uh, of a boy here. 
What a beautiful sight. Palm trees in the back. <laughs> QB1 putting on his helmet. Hey, you know what, Reason? It, it, it's all good that he has his uh, uniform on, helmet, and everything. What presses me? Check it. The, on. Mus the, Check the muscle you put on. Hold on. Here's the throw to Malcolm Perry, baby. Woo! Right over the Perry middle. Perry looks good, too. Looks Perry looks good, too. Looks smooth. But go ahead, Dolphins. Sorry, I just wanted to highlight. Yeah, that. no. What when impresses me this year? What I'm so excited about too is the, the mass, the muscle mass he put on. That's what I love about. Especially this in the year. lower half for the body. The, yes, yeah. just that's that muscle. He looks a lot, not a little bit, but a lot thicker. Hmm. Look at the zip on that ball. Man, that was pretty. Oh, baby, pretty clean, catch. clean catch oh, by Perry. Baby, and then for you guys who haven't seen it, some pictures were released today. Um. Obviously, my favorite pitcher of the lot. Nice. And then um, we it have. It looks right, man. It looks right. The helmet. It just... oh, it's, it's destiny, bro. God. It's destiny. Wait till I show the, the trailer. It'll be even more destiny. Look at that. Left arm of God <sighs> in action, baby. Look at that. See, that's another thing. If people go watch the Herbert tape. I, I don't. If you guys remember me, I was talking about Herbert. I always highlighted how his front arm, he always swam with it. And that's a perfect example of a still shot of how you want that arm up high and tight, um, you know, because that does affect, uh, you know, I've gone over this before, you know, front arm, that affects basically up to down trajectory, head, proper head, place, uh, head placement affects right to left. So placement. why do some quarterbacks put their hand against their chest? It's just and tighter. They're just tighter against their chest. That's all. You want it straight left, tight against your chest. This is mid-motion, so I have I to see. watch the end of it. It might come near his chest by the end of it. Okay. But if you watch Herbert, the one thing was because he's right-handed, you would always see instead of like like tight to the chest throw, you'd see like swim. Yeah. Like throw like that. It was weird, man. Or it could be down. It could be up. Yeah, it, it was just – it was not good. And that's why you saw accuracy issues, especially towards the sidelines. Watch his front arm it was, and then watch his feet, obviously. So it's like a bow and arrow. Exactly. Wait. That's actually yeah. a really good comparison. I never thought about that. That's a good one. Um, and then this is the trailer. Um, here, let me make sure the audio is on. Trailer is fire. Um, oh, I got something for you all after this too. You all are going to love it. <laughs> okay, I'll play this for you guys and I'll load up what I got. In Samoan culture, we believe in prophecies. Before my grandfather passed away, he prophesied about me. He would say, Tua, your name is everything. And one day, it will be known all over the world. How do you stop Tua? This is your destiny. Tua Tungabailoa. Tua Tua from Hawaii. An instant legend. I work tirelessly. My family pushing me, supporting me every single day to be the best. I want to make him the best quarterback in, in college. After a while, his prophecy began to unfold. He changed the way we look at Alabama football. To the end zone, touchdown, Alabama wins! 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, No eyes have seen, no ears have heard, and no mind has ever imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And two is down. In the moment, you know, I may never play football again. I've had that feeling. Your body knows something's wrong. Somebody says it's his hip. And then I was really, really concerned. You have a decision to make. Do I come back and play, or I go and chase my dream of playing in the NFL? Right now, he's got to make that call. If I come back, the risk is, what if I get hurt again? My name is Tua Tungo Bailo. I will be declaring and entering the 2020 NFL Draft. I play for more than myself. I play for the name on the back of my jersey. I play for my Samoan culture, but most importantly, I play for my family's legacy. Welcome to the first virtual NFL draft. I don't see Joe Burrow having a documentary. I can't wait. That's I my can't wait. 
What was Man. the date on that? What was the date on that? September sixth. Good, because yeah. my jersey 4 comes PM. first. My jersey and I think comes what, first. what is it? It's Man. a. I think it's a. Six, it's a six part series or an eight part series. Six. Wow. Damn. This guy. This guy's out here talking about. I'm. I'm fulfilling a prophecy. Have you guys ever have you ever looked in on YouTube and how his grandfather predicted for him? It's amazing yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. crazy. Yo, yeah. once guy, he starts, this, this guy is carrying. This guy is like carrying the whole island on his back. We're gonna be on TV so much. <laughs> Yo, we're gonna be on TV so much once we no. once he starts and starts. You guys, guys, you guys we're gonna be on TV every. Did you, guys hear, every other week did you guys hear what the report, the report was that came out uh, a few days ago? Wow, what was it? What's that? I, I don't have it queued up, but uh, me and EM talked about it because we both saw it. Basically, what from what people are hearing right now is December. The internal plan for Tua. is it is December for Tua. Um, right, before, right, right before I believe it's right before the Joe Burrow game. So they're yeah. doing like Kansas City right. with Alex Smith with Mahomes. You know they're just like that. I'm not even, I think I think though if 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 we're like three and if we're like you know like three and nine or three and ten don't even bother I think. But question reason question reason this is what I wanted to say this is what I was trying to check with well, Buffalo last year mm -hmm. what what were the rankings on the teams that they beat. Mm, one playoff team. They had a poor schedule the year before last. One, one had a playoff poor team. One, one exactly. playoff team. We're getting that type of schedule again this year with Fitzy in shape, as Rhino said, with Chan Gelly's offense, with a proven Devontae Parker who's going to step it up a level and a healthy Preston Williams. Did y'all see that catch? A confident yeah. Gusecki. Yo, oh, yeah. confident yeah. Gusecki, a running game, a revamped offensive line, yep. and a revamped defense. That's when I'm like, this could be the 2009 Dolphins all over again it, it who were 1-15 yeah. with an hmm. experienced quarterback that's what I'm saying. And a plan a last place schedule. Uh -huh. That's all mm -hmm. I'm saying. And with no Tom Brady. And on top of that, you got a, a healthy Matt Collins uh, working yeah, the fryer, man. making sure to get the wings right. So, <laughs> man, I don't know the way. That's guys, all I'm saying, y'all. That's there, all I'm saying. Actually, I have a little bit of optimism. Just there's a, a little bit. There's a documentary coming out actually about another one of our players, guys. Um, it doesn't have a release date yet. I don't no, know. Don't do it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have seen it, but <laughs> oh, it, still, mm, still waiting on the release date. Oh god! Mm. But it, it's probably coming real soon. Release it. <laughs> Oh man! Shout out, shout out to my graphic guy for killing it once more. Yeah, he did. <laughs> What's the name of the guy who played Waterboy again? Bobby um, Boucher. Adam Sandler. Oh, yeah, Adam, Bobby yeah, did, Sandler. did Adam Sandler uh, give you the copyrights to this, man? <laughs> oh, it's edited. Public play. Wow. Um, so that's yeah, crazy. That's, be on the lookout for that. That actually probably will happen and will drop this season. You foul, man. You foul, Damn. man. That's sad. That's messed up. But man, you, you on you on Rosen like he owes you money. Oh man. No, nah, he owns some chicken wings. That's the problem. He owes <laughs> me some time. He owes me some time. Exactly. That's a fact. He, he owes, owes me a second round pick. Well, and he owes the Dolphins a couple million a doll a couple million dollars too. Uh, and a draft man. pick. Nah, yeah, I had no idea. I mean, we ain't getting that, that draft bad, pick back, but that bad as Beck. I had no clue. Oh, you None. Lie. You hate to see it. You hate to see it. Yeah, um, but so, guys, we're going to be back tomorrow night, me and the Dolphin. We're going to have on uh, Ali Goodman, a.k.a. Dolph Freaky, a.k.a. at Dolphin Lady 99 on Instagram. She's going to be on the show tomorrow. So, um, yeah, we'll be back tomorrow night. Other than that, guys, I'm about to get out of here with everyone. Fins up, as always. Thank you, too, Damien. We'll see everyone Peace. tomorrow night. Fins up.